네, 여러분 안녕하십니까. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the participants for attending the Social Enterprise Leaders Forum 2021, hosted by the Ministry of Employment and Labor and organized by the Korea Social Enterprise Promotion Agency. I'd like to extend my deepest gratitude to everyone for being with us today. I am Kim Kyung Mi, who will host this forum. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. This forum is held under the theme of changing the world with solidarity and cooperation, an era of transition and the future of social economy. We have prepared keynote speeches, presentations, and panel discussions. Due to the COVID-19 outbreak following last year, this year again, we have been unable to hold an in-person forum, inviting a lot of participants. So we are live streaming through our YouTube channel. And at the venue, Korean speakers, members of the host, organizer, and partner organizations are participating in person. Everyone is following social distancing guidelines and wearing masks. Um, and I would like to ask everyone participating online to fill out the satisfaction survey or participate through the live chat window. We would like to ask for your active participation. You can either use the QR code on the YouTube screen or click show more and follow the link to fill out the satisfaction survey. And when you are leaving your comments on the YouTube chat window, please leave your last four digits of your phone number that you've provided to us in the pre-registration form. Now we will begin the 2021 Social Enterprise and Leaders Forum. We will invite uh, Jung hyung Mr. Jung hyung President of Korea Social Enterprise Promotion Agency. Please give him a warm round of applause. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jung hyung President of Korea Social Enterprise Promotion Agency. I'd like to welcome you all to the 2021 Social Enterprise Leaders Forum. I'd like to thank Vice Minister Park Kwa Jin of the Ministry of Employment and Labor, President Muhammad Yunus, speakers from home and abroad, and distinguished guests, and all sponsors and partners for this forum. I'd like to also welcome and thank all the viewers who's joining us online. Uh, regarding the social economy of Korea, the ICA President Ariel Guarco said that it's dynamic, diverse, and drawing the attention of the world with the powerful support policies of public institutions. That is correct. Since the introduction of the Social Enterprise Promotion Act in 2007, Korea uh, has been laying the foundation to support social economy organizations, including community enterprises, self-sufficiency enterprises, cooperatives, and social ventures. And thanks to the commitment of social economy practitioners, we have created more than 30,000 social economy organizations. Uh, in the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, social economy enterprises have maintained employment and provided services to protect the vulnerable groups. It is obvious that social economy enterprises are effective protagonists of creating social value. This year's international forum is being organized with the theme of, theme of an era of transition, the future of social economy. In the three zero visions put forward by President Muhammad Yunus, uh, carbon zero, uh, wealth concentration zero, and unemployment zero are urgent issues for the Korean society. Uh, we have recently introduced the Framework Act on Carbon Neutrality and started our journey to the uh, net zero 2050. But wealth concentration is getting worse, uh, and we are yet to find alternatives to unemployment. Uh, on top of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we have to also pay attention to the digital uh, transformation and the emphasis on ESG. Now we have to think about how to practice our solutions. First of all, in the public sector, uh, we have to work 
beyond public procurement for the sustainability of social economy enterprises uh, and uh, think hard about how to encourage the cooperation between the public sector and social economy enterprises. In the private sector, uh, we have to encourage private enterprises for cooperation and support. The current environment with the emphasis on ESG, ESG management uh, is a great opp opportunity uh, for us uh, to create cooperation between large businesses and social economy enterprises to create social value. We have uh, practical examples already. SK Energy uh, invested in 4EN who produced coffee waste pellets in order to uh, get emission rights. Uh, ARN, a social venture, received investment uh, for its microfiltering system from various uh, investors, naming it Open Innovation. It's also important for the citizens to participate. We have introduced the Buy Social campaign from the UK. Buy Social uh, is an important uh, practice uh, to realize the value of uh, value-based uh, consumption by purchasing social economy enterprise products. And last but not least, I'd like to talk about the practice following the international forum. Uh, last year, uh, we have talked about resource circulation energy transition, and at the time, I have already mentioned uh, the Framework Act on Carbon Neutrality. And since uh, the last year's forum, we have uh, scaled up our support for eco-friendly enterprises. And I believe that uh, with the uh, R&D projects on uh, resource circulation, uh, the technologies in the sector will advance uh, sharply. Now we start the Social Enterprise Leaders Forum 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Zhang, for opening this year's forum. Thank you very much uh, for uh, pointing out the significance of practice uh, and opportunities regarding the uh, Social Enterprise Leaders Forum. Uh, we have many people uh, sharing their congratulatory remarks, including uh, Vice Minister Park Kwa Jin of the Ministry of em Employment and Labor. Let's take a look at his video. Good afternoon. I am Park Kwa Jin, Vice Minister of Employment and Labor. It is very meaningful to hold the Social Enterprise Leaders Forum 2021 under the theme of an era of transition and the future of social economy with experts from home and abroad. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to our keynote speakers, co-founder Muhammad Yunus of Yunus Sports Hub and Professor Kim Yong Jin of Sogang University, speakers and panelists, and all the participants for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. Social Enterprise Leaders Forum was an inaugurated in 2012, and it had served as the venue for sharing the end collaboration, presenting an outlook on the global trend of social economy, and sharing the experiences and response measures of each country. In the run-up to the shift towards living with COVID, I believe this forum will serve as a precious opportunity to gather a variety of input for discussing challenges and hopes facing the social economy and addressing future tasks. Social economy is acknowledged as an inclusive growth model that boosts market economy efficiency while addressing the unemployment and poverty issues. With the growing awareness of the importance of solidarity and cooperation among economic players in addressing the challenges of the recent COVID-19 outbreak, the role of social economy is increasingly garnering attention. EU and many countries have already been focusing on expanding the social economy, building on the foundation of civil societies. Unis Sports Hub of France is a prime example. For the 2024 Paris Olympic Games, Unis Sports Hub will help expand the participation of work integration social enterprises and public procurement of goods used for the Olympic Games. The Buy Social campaign that took off in the UK in 2012 has become the leading model for practicing social value through good consumption and is now spreading to many countries across the globe. Recently, businesses are embarking on ESG management, creating new growth opportunities for social enterprises. SK Group measured 222 companies' performance and rewarded a total of 10.6 billion won in value last year through its social progress credit, creating a virtuous cycle in the business ecosystem, thereby enlarging the growth potential of social economy. These cases mean a lot to us as we prepare 
for advancing the quality of our social economy based on public, private, and civil society cooperation in the transition to a post-COVID era. The Korean government has designated social economy re revitalization as one of the national policy tasks in 2017 and announced the social economy revitalization plan. And we have provided policy support for building self-sufficiency of social economy enterprises, diversifying fields, and strengthening cooperation among social economy players. Recently, relevant departments are cooperating in announcing and implementing job creation measures and sales channel support measures in order to hasten the transition to a sustainable economy. The government has ample experience to provide support. And as a responsible member, it is collaborating with the international community by actively participating in building an Asian social economy cooperation system. For the social economy, the 19th century was about safeguarding human dignity from the capitalist threats. Today, the social entrepreneurs' spirits are serving as seeds to mature modern capitalism through inclusive growth. I hope that today's international forum lay the foundation for the advancement of social enterprises that invest in people. Thank you. Thank you. Please give him a warm round of applause. And that was uh, Vice Minister Park Hwa Jin from the Ministry of Employment and Labor. He has sent us a message of encouragement and also uh, shared with us some keywords. I have high hopes on this forum. And now we'll move on to the keynote speech. We have two keynote speeches today. The first will be provided by Mr. Yuan Nugi, co-founder and managing uh, co-founder of Unis Sports Hub and a, a Peace Nobel Laureate. Now, please uh, listen to uh, President Yunus. Underline some of the issues that uh, we focus on. We do social enterprise, but we make it very clear. In our social enterprise, we are not looking for making personal money out of the enterprise. So making personal Profit is not part of our job. We leave it out right at the door. We say what we are doing is for transforming the society. Entire devotion is changing the society, solving the people's problems. That's our focus. That's our task. Without making a penny personal. So our personal interest is sub surrendered completely. We are focused on a collective interest. We want to solve collective problems, not my personal problem of making money. So that we leave out in this business. So we call it social business. So while we do social enterprise, our social enterprise is pure social business, no profit involved. That's fine. We are not against social enterprises. We are okay. But I'm only saying this is how our specialization lies. In our business, we don't want to make money, so that our mind is free from making money. Sometimes you feel if you have also have the idea of making money, your thinking process get kind of mixed up. And when your ideas get mixed up, you focus more on making money than doing the social good. So in order not to be disturbed by personal interest, we remove the personal interest right from the beginning. No personal interest, no profit making. Personal profit. Company makes profit, yes, but the profit stays with the company and rolled back into the business. So we are not a non profit, we are profit making organization, but the profit belongs to the business, not to the person, not to the owners. We have owners, but owners promise right from the beginning in the document that we will never take any dividend out of this business, we will never take any profit out of this business. Profit will be rolled back into the business. All we can do, we can take back our initial investment. That we can do. If we put $1 million in the business, over time we'll get our $1 million back, but not a penny more. Now, whatever income comes, whatever profit comes, profit is rolled back into the business. That's a social business. Then we create many other things. We are involved in environment, we want to make sure we solve all the problems of the people, not just one type of problem. Every type of problem. 
that's why we summed up by saying we want to build a world of three zeros. It's easy to remember. Our first zero is zero net carbon emission. We want to build social businesses to stop global warming so that we make the world livable for everybody. Not make us extinct on this planet because we misbehave on this planet. We ruined this whole planet by global warming and we destroyed our home and we brought an end to ourselves. That's not the stupid thing we want to do. We want to undo whatever we have mistake, all the stupid things we have done in the past. That's what we want to do very clearly. We stop them and we create a world where there will be no global warming. So zero global warming. Zero net carbon emission. That's our number one zero. Zero number two, we want to end wealth concentration. All the wealth is getting concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. If you look at any country, this is the same thing. All the wealth belongs to top 1% or 2% people. The rest of the people have to share with remaining 1% or 2% wealth to the entire population. That's a wrong system. So by creating social business, we want to make sure we undo the system, reverse the system. Wealth should not be rushing to the top, to the super rich. Wealth will stay with the people who created this world. After all, wealth is created by people. But this wealth rushes out to the rich people by this way we build our institutions, our policies, and so on. That we want to change. So zero net carbon emission. Zero wealth concentration. That's two zeros. Three zero, turn number three zero, zero unemployment by unleashing the power of entrepreneurship as well. You know, we want to become entrepreneurs. We don't want to look for jobs. We are not job seekers. We are job creators. That's what we tell the young people to repeat. We are not job seekers. We are job creators. We are entrepreneurs. All human beings are born as entrepreneurs. That's the message that we want. And if you all become entrepreneurs, there is no unemployment because nobody is employing anybody. So that's the kind of thing we want to do. And particularly with artificial intelligence coming in very sharply, which will displace all human beings in the world. This is very important thing to remember. We are not job seekers. We don't want artificial intelligence to come and take away our activities. And that's our promise. So we'll create a world of three zeros, zero net carbon emission, zero wealth concentration, and zero unemployment. And that's our focus. And we, we are very happy that we can work together with Korean Social Enterprise Promotion Agency. Thank you very much. Wish you all the success. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, President Muhammad Yunus, the Nobel Peace Laureate and the founder of Grameen Bank. So uh, he talked about three zeros, zero carbon emissions, zero wealth concentration, and zero unemployment. I believe uh, this is a key message we all have to remember. We're moving on to the second keynote speech. I'd like to invite Professor Kim Yong-jin of Sogang University, uh, who will make a presentation with his video. Let's take a look. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to extend my deepest congratulations for the opening of the Social Enterprise Leaders Forum 2021, and I'd like to thank the organizers and the host for inviting me. Today, I would like to talk about the evolution of the social economy in the age of great transition. I am Kim Yong-jin, professor of business management at Sogang University. Glad to meet you. First, well, these are the contents that I'd like to cover. With COVID-19 ingrained in every corner of our lives, I would like to talk about the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19, how we should understand digital transformation and ESG in that context and 
how we should understand businesses are addressing digital transformation and ESG issues, and how should social economy enterprises respond to them. As you are well aware, after 2008, the world has faced a new phenomenon called the new normal. Before 2008, we had experienced high growth, high price, and high interest rates. But after 2008, the world has been facing low growth, low price, and low interest rates. And we call this the new normal. But with the outbreak of COVID-19, we can well say that the new normal is back. But then, although we talk about digitalization and ESG these days, I believe that the new normal would be best expressed by the concept of VUCA. VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. First, vol volatility. It means that the speed of change is extremely high. Second, uncertainty which means we don't know what will happen tomorrow. Third is complexity. The situation being extremely complex, it becomes very difficult to make a decision. In other words, we have to take into account numerous variables when making a decision. Some people even say that a butterfly in New York flapping its wing sand may finally cause a storm in Beijing. The world is intricately connected, which makes it extremely difficult to link the cause to an outcome. The last point is ambiguity. In the past, it was quite easy to identify the cause and effect. So if we do X, then we could achieve Y. That's what used to happen before. However, now the relationship between the cause and effect is very ambiguous. So when a specific incident occurs, it takes a lot of time until we finally understand about that incident. And against this backdrop, COVID-19 is having a big impact on our economy. And there are many socioeconomic impacts that COVID-19 is imposing on us, and the impact can be categorized into three groups, consumer, business, and global. First, the consumer side. There is a high demand for contactless services these days. There is also high demand for O2O service, which have been had been around even before COVID-19. O2O refers to online to offline or offline to online services. Now the demand for O2O service is expanding rapidly. And now contactless payment method is increasingly favored. Also, self-service. With digital transformation accelerating and with the COVID-19 outbreak, we are seeing a growth of self-services, sharing service, or subscription-based services. So these are the trends on the consumer side. Now on the business side, digital transformation is accelerating, triggered by the changes happening among consumers. There is a high demand for robotic production in order to raise productivity. With digitalization, platform businesses are rising. On top of that, data and AI are growing in importance. And all of these are eventually putting pressure on companies to engage in personalized production. As you are well aware, globally we are witnessing the end of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism refers to an extreme form of liberalism. Globally, there had always been movement of goods, capital, and people. But under the concept of neoliberalism, all forms of movement have to be free. But now with COVID-19, this trend is fizzling out rapidly and protectionism is surging. With expanded protectionism, the global value chain is also undergoing changes. 
production and logistics had been executed based on the global value chain. But with the global value chain breaking down and reconfigured, we are seeing the rise of a reshoring trend. I believe you're well aware of the fact that China used to be the global factory. But with increasing tension between China and the US, China's role is becoming more and more limited. And the rise of the commodity price is also boosting the reshoring trend. The US in particular is bringing back its manufacturing businesses. And other Western countries are also reshoring their manufacturing businesses. The fact that physical movement is challenging due to COVID-19 is triggering the digital cooperation trend. So what kind of impact would these trends have on our businesses over the short term, midterm, and the long term? As you are well aware, the impacts would be different depending on which field you are in. But then overall, we're seeing revenue dropping, which is deepening financing issues and funding issues which again aggravates employment insecurity. So businesses are hard pressed to go through restructuring. Over the midterm, what kind of impact would we see? Now, in order to address these trends, we need to make our production process more efficient. We have to be addressing the ESG issues more rapidly. And here, consumer change is key. Consumers have strong preference for customized production or personalized services. So businesses have to build a foundation for personalized production, and they have to understand because customers' needs based on data, and they have to integrate products and services to address those needs. And these kinds of changes will be emerging over the midterm. What about over the, the long term? We are seeing an accelerated pace of digital transformation. So we're going to see the survival of the fittest even in the digital realm. And we do need this digital transformation. And I will explain why we need it later in the presentation. So where would be a rise in on-demand service? So there would be a rise in on-demand services. And since on-demand service can be provided globally, it will be important to build global capability and the key lies in ESG innovation, uh, R&D capability to support the move. Considering the COVID-19 outbreak, I would like to focus on the two most important trends, which are digital transformation and ESG. I would like to elaborate on digital transformation and ESG and also touch upon what we have to do. Digital transformation is shifting the economic paradigm from a mass production system to a customized production system. In other words, we are seeing a shift to an on-demand economy. As you can see from this graph, in the past, we started off from a cottage industry and then moved on to mass production. And now we are transitioning to a customized or personalized production. But then for the small and medium-sized businesses, Mass customization is almost impossible because it requires a lot of time and effort. And that is what we call the value cost dilemma. And digital transformation can help businesses address this dilemma. Then how do we do digital transformation? A lot of people would be confused and many would understand digital transformation as simply AI, big data and cloud computing. But that's not really what digital transformation is all about. It's about businesses standardizing, modularizing, and digitalizing their materials, processes, and resources, and controlling the offline resources from online, enabling on-demand services. So here's the thing. Why do we need digital transformation? The answer lies in on-demand service. 
on-demand service refers to a service that solves customers' problems at the time, place, and method of the customer's choosing. So what does that mean over the long term? Now, since the economy is moving towards an on-demand system, if businesses do not transform themselves into an on-demand service providers, they will fail and digital transformation would be the foundation for providing on-demand services. And this diagram illustrates the overall trend. The existing offline data are moving into online. This helped data technology to advance, and by automating existing physical machines, process technology had been able to advance as well. And now these two are turning into product technology on the back of digital transformation. This trend includes the likes of smart machine and smart city. And this transformation is represented in the global top 10 market cap rankings as of December 2008. The top 10 list would include PetroChina, Exxon, Mobile, Gazprom, or Royal Dutch Shell, which are mostly energy companies. But as of May 2021, Apple tops the list. And we're seeing companies such as Microsoft, energy companies like Saudi Aram Saudi's Aramco is standing at number three. Most of the companies are big tech such as Amazon, Google, Facebook, Tencent, Tesla, Alibaba. These companies are all digital service providers and some are platform providers. So. One concrete example of this change would be the following. In the past, if a child draws a picture of a doll, a unique one and only drawing of a doll in the world, it had been difficult to produce this doll because the plants will not make a single doll for this one child. But now things have changed. If the child draws a picture of her doll, take a photo of it and send it to this company, then it would pattern, print, and cut and make this doll all digitally. So this one and only doll can be made at a very affordable price. And that is what digital transformation can make available to us. And with COVID-19, the food industry is enjoying its heyday. Actually, livestock farming emits CO2 the most, and cows emit the most amount of CO2. But now, businesses are trying to produce meat not by livestock farming, but by combining water, air, and protein. So these companies, such as Beyond Meat, Impossible, Memphis Meats, are such meat makers. Just as a company that produces eggs with water, air, and protein, Mufri produces milk with water, air, and protein, and Finless Foods produces salmon and tuna with water, air, and protein. If you have these materials, you can also make your own food with a 3D printing service. So these are the changes that are occurring today. Now, luxury fashion brands such as Burberry is jumping on this bandwagon. Burberry's bespoke service allows their customers to design and order their own Burberry trench coats by themselves. And Burberry provides a silhouette, material, textile, color, design, all based on a customized service platform. They are providing a total of 1.2 million combinations. Another such example of the uh, smart factory of Siemens. Uh, Siemens is actively utilizing the digital twin technology. So the uh, customers design themselves and the manufacturing is done real time. And 99.7% of the products uh, can be produced within 24 hours. Now, the Siemens Smart Factory is utilizing IoT, Internet of Things. And what's important here is that this factory can change the uh, production line setup about 5,000 times a year, which is a very high level of customization realized uh, in order to uh, produce more than 1,000 different types of products. So, how, so these uh, technologies are resolving the value cost dilemma. Now, let's now talk about ESG. 
with the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate change uh, is being emphasized much more than before. And uh, based on the Paris Agreement in 2016, governments around the world agreed that uh, they will reach net zero emissions by 2050. Korea also pledged uh, to cut emissions by 40% uh, by 2030 to achieve net zero by 2050. Investors around the world are taking into consideration ESG elements in their investing decisions. So these are some numbers that show global ESG investment trends. So in 2016, the ESG uh, investment uh, scale was $7.8 trillion, and in 2019, uh, it was $13.8 trillion. It's not just in the, in the uh, North America or Europe, it's the same around the world. So in the three years uh, between 2016 and 2019, uh, the uh, annual growth rate uh, was more than 20%. And in this growth, uh, public pension funds uh, and institutional investors have driven the, uh, this change. And basically, investors are divesting uh, from uh, enterprises not uh, conducting uh, ESG management, uh, and they are integrating ESG in their investing decisions increasingly. So what is ESG? It's the environment, social, and governance. In the environment, uh, the, the enterprises focus on fighting climate change, restoration of natural capital, and creating new business opportunities in clean technology, new and renewable energy, green building, and so on. In social, uh, the enterprises focus on nurturing human capital, responsibility of re uh, their products, uh, and working with various stakeholders in governance, uh, transparency of the governance structure, anti-corruption, and uh, instability are key issues. And as you may well know, what's most uh, critical in ESG investment is whether ESG actually helps corporate performance. When we take a look at these numbers, we can see that the uh, enterprises that excel at ESG actually have better performance. Uh, but there are some remaining issues, like the uh, lack of transparency, uh, and uh, difficulty in measuring and managing risk. So uh, the digital transformation is going on, ESG uh, is drawing the attention. And what should uh, the enterprises do? I believe there are five main pillars. So with the focus on ESG innovation and digital transformation, uh, enterprises uh, have to achieve business model innovation based on data. And since this innovation can, can't be done alone, uh, partnership is critical. So who uh, do you need to partner with? Now, large business, uh, businesses are investing uh, in leading the transformation. And the uh, large platforms or big tech, uh, uh, big techs are even reaching monopoly in the market. In contrast, small and medium-sized enterprises or SMEs uh, cannot uh, make a huge investment in digital transformation. Uh, and they are late in uh, responding to uh, ESD trend. So they're losing competitiveness. In particular, there are two issues for uh, social economy. The first one uh, is uh, value cost dilemma that I mentioned earlier. So I want to go on demand, but it costs just too much. I want to go ESG, but it costs too much. How should we solve this issue? And the second issue uh, related to the first one uh, is the small size of social economy enterprises. So the economy of scale work doesn't work for them. 
with a small size, uh, they don't have the uh, capacity uh, to pursue digital transformation or ESG management. And actually, in digital economy, uh, the uh, economy of scope is also critical, as some of you have heard in the uh, long tail discussion. And it's difficult for social economy enterprises to work with other social economy enterprises since they have uh, simple business models. So th there are some issues uh, in this era of great uh, transition. The uh, marginalization and inequality of uh, the uh, socially vulnerable, uh, the uh, widening rich-poor gap, uh, increasing instability uh, in the economy, politics, and the society. So what should we do? We have to actively respond to the issues with innovation. And what transitioning in this context uh, is uh, the fact that uh, in uh, 2010, uh, Cameron uh, put forward this idea of big society uh, as an alternative uh, to restore uh, the uh, public value, democracy, and autonomy in the society uh, in order to resolve the failure of both the government and the market. Uh, in other words, we have to uh, now emphasize a sense of community and social value. Uh, for enterprises, uh, the key uh, issue uh, will be network cooperation and business uh, cooperatives. So network cooperation uh, is about partnering uh, with other enterprises. And uh, when this partnership is more institutionalized, uh, they can evolve into cooperatives. So with uh, cooperation, they can achieve economy of scale and economy of scope and utilize common brand uh, and provide knowledge services. One such example is the commercial cooperative in France. Now the uh, commercial cooperative uh, Cooperatives, uh, commercial cooperatives in France uh, account for about 30% uh, in the uh, retail market in more than 30 different sectors as of 2014. Uh, they account for 7% of the national GDP. Now, there are 89 uh, commercial cooperatives uh, with more than 31,000 member uh, small businesses. And uh, what's uh, interesting is that in any economic situation, including economic crises, uh, cooperatives, uh, commercial cooperatives in France have been more stable uh, than other uh, for-profit uh, franchise networks. And uh, when it comes to the number of premises and employment, uh, commercial cooperatives are also growing continuously. So let me uh, get to the closing. So what are the challenges ahead of us? ESG innovation utilizing uh, digital transformation with the ultimate goal of providing on-demand service. Now, uh, ESG is a very uh, strong uh, initiative that all enterprises now have to follow uh, in order to gain a uh, customer base. So uh, it is a must, uh, and it should be based on uh, digital transformation. And what's also important is something that we often uh, disregard. So uh, you want to uh, create the most eco-friendly product, uh, but at the same time, you also uh, want to appeal to consumers so that your products can sell. Uh, and for that, you need a unique design strategy. Uh, in which uh, you have to think about the uh, uh, changes in your product and service. Uh, and it is only possible by partnering with other actors in the social economy. Now, all these cannot be done in social economy alone. You need public support.
So earlier I uh, talked about the need uh, for a sense of community. And actually, uh, my generation uh, wasn't really educated on community values, and I think the younger generation is no better. Uh, so we have to nurture experts uh, who can encourage cooperation. We also need education on cooperation and partnership. And when we pursue network cooperation uh, or organize uh, cooperatives with these experts and uh, educated people, uh, we need we need uh, support uh, initiatives. And a key here is creation of a fund uh, specialized in cooperative initiatives. So it's not a general purpose fund uh, to support cooperatives. It's only for partnership and cooperative initiatives. And for co-ops to uh, succeed, uh, you have to overcome certain challenges. First of all, uh, you need to gain the trust of its members that it can succeed. And uh, also, the trust of the members to uh, that uh, it can uh, be operated uh, professionally, and you have to make sure that the cooperative uh, members uh, will will not uh, take their own path separately after making a lot of money. So again, we are going through a digital transformation, and the. Uh, reason for that is to provide on-demand services for consumers. Uh, in other words, uh, helping uh, consumers solve their problems anytime, anywhere. And with these changes, we have to uh, have a new attitude uh, considering sustainable development uh, and addressing uh, environmental issues and social issues uh, and uh, governance uh, issues in order to survive and succeed. And all these challenges uh, cannot be done uh, by a single social economy enterprise because it's a uh, small and inexperienced. Uh, and these uh, small enterprises have to work together in order to uh, achieve economy of scale and the economy of scope. Uh, and create brand identity and gain more bargaining power. And co-ops uh, themselves are not a guarantee for success. They have to be more cohesive, uh, which is in, which can be encouraged by active investment. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Kim Myung Jin of Sokang University. So uh, he talked about uh, the uh, evolution of social economy in the era of great uh, transformation. So he emphasized uh, uh, the need for ESG management and digital transformation and the challenges for social enterprises. So we have uh, finished the uh, opening uh, session of the uh, Social Enterprise Leaders Forum 2021, and we will now move on uh, to presentations. Uh, before moving on, uh, you can uh, download the uh, program book from uh, the website of the Social Enterprise Leaders uh, Forum. Uh, and uh, you can also uh, access our uh, website uh, via the link in the uh, View More tab on our YouTube channel. Uh, or you can search Social Enterprise Leaders Forum uh, on the uh, search uh, engine. And if you have any questions, uh, please leave them uh, in the uh, comment box in the, uh, on the uh, YouTube channel, and we'll make sure they are answered in the uh, Q&A. We'll now move on to the first presentation. Uh, the presenter uh, is uh, Yuan Nogie, uh, co-founder of Unisports Hub, uh, with the uh, title of Public uh, Addressing Social uh, problems with public procurement and public social economic cooperation. Hello, everybody. It is a great pleasure to be here with you at the Social Enterprise Leaders Forum. Thank you so much for the invite to the organizers and to 
all the people that are involved in the event. Well, you have certainly heard about Professor Yunus uh, uh, because you're in the framework of social enterprise, but also because uh, he was speaking to you earlier. My name is Yuan Noguier. I am the co-founder with Professor Yunus of an organization called the Yunus Sports Hub, which is basically putting the huge network of Professor Yunus in more than 150 countries at the service of the sport industry to solve people's problem. And the way we do that is that we promote social enterprise in the sport industry. We help organizations in the sport industry to implement social business. And finally, we support a community of social business entrepreneurs in the sport industry. Maybe to speak about what we do and, and the, the practical aspect about uh, the international uh, sporting events that are happening and that are going to happen in a few years in Korea and how we can use social business and social enterprise as a driving force uh, to, to solve people's problem in the, in the framework of this event. Maybe reminding who Professor Yunus is, as you know, is the founder of the Grameen Bank. Uh, and the initiator of the social enterprise and social business movement throughout the world. Uh, he's been uh, defining, the, the, of course, the social business concept as a business to solve problem. Himself have created more than 60 of these businesses, these social businesses in Bangladesh. A lot of them in, uh, uh, they have a, a national uh, uh, size big big social businesses in all the field that you may think about such as uh, access to safe drinking water lack of nurses in hospital uh, lack of access to telecommunication you name it professor Yunus has been building all of these businesses to solve problem of the people in bangladesh and uh, when you think about how we can use this power this effectiveness of the social enterprise and the social business concept into the sport industry, this is where our organization comes into play. The Unisport Sub is about solving problems within the sport industry, but also thanks to all the leverage that we have in the sport industry. So when I think about the problems in the sport industry, we are thinking here about, you know, all these big problems that happen because sport is no different from any other sector. It has problems, it has flaws. So when you think about uh, uh, gender equality in sport is not uh, very good. When you think about racism in stadium, when you think about uh, uh, distribution of wealth in sport, which look like nearly an impression of the society where you have athletes earning millions and most of the athletes that are struggling with, uh, with uh, uh, financier their career or their post career. So we create programs to uh, uh, that uses social enterprise concept to solve these problems within the sport industry. So if we take the problem of wealth distribution among athletes, meaning that some athletes are poor or are unemployed, we have created with the International Olympic Committee a program that is called the Athlete 365 Business Accelerator, which is basically a global incubator on all five continents for athletes to become entrepreneur as a way to finance their career or their post career. So they get the tools, the skills, the access to funding and connection that they need so that they are able to finance their career and go out of poverty. This is, uh, as you see, a completely different approach from just giving government uh, grant uh, or, or uh, uh, national federation grant to the athlete. It is empowering them through a social enterprise model, meaning a self-sustainable model to uh, uh, design their own financial freedom. So this is one example, but maybe uh, coming to the example that for us today is, uh, 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 is, uh, is right in the topic of this forum. When we think about the power that sport has, a big power of sport is about 
the economic power. It is undeniable that sport is a big sector. In, in fact, globally, economically, sport represents a 1.3 US do, uh, sorry, a 1.3 trillion US dollar business. So it is a huge business. Even when we take it at the scale of one event, the Olympics. This is a 7 billion euro project. This is a budget of the of the of the Paris 2024 Olympics. Uh, of course, a lot of people think that this is a waste of money, but we see that as a fantastic opportunity because think about it. This money would not go to hospital. It would not go to transportation. This is money that is created by the sport industry through the TV rights, through the sales of licensing product, through partnership and sponsorship. So this is actually a fantastic opportunity to solve people problem that we have because it's a huge amount of money in a small amount of time in a small geographical situation. So how do we do to take advantage of this fantastic opportunity? Well, this is what we have been doing with Paris 2024 with the ESS 2024 platform. ESS 2024 means social business 2024 in French. Um, basically, the idea is the following. We have these 7 billion euros to organize again. This is a huge budget. This is a huge procurement power. Each one of these euro will be used to buy from product or services suppliers. How can we do to maximize within this big pool of supplier, the supplier that will come from the social enterprise sector, because these enterprises will not only deliver the product or the service that we need to organize the games, but will also do it with a social or environmental advantage. For example, when we have to buy food for, for the athletes, for 14,000 athletes, well, we can do it through a standard catering company, but we can also do it through a social enterprise or social business company that will only work with refugees or only employ long-term unemployed people or will only source locally grown product that are environmental friendly. So you see, we are getting the same product, which is the food, but with a complete different impact. And of course, this is a very simplified way of putting this program, right? Uh, because if it was so simple, we would only go with social enterprise. So maybe a bit more of a detail about what is happening within this program. You know, this is really much about how do we make sure that events organizers, but also supplier of product and services are creating the maximum impact possible. In a lot of situations, of course, we need strong expertise. You know, we need suppliers that are big suppliers, that have the financial backup, that have experience in big events as well, operationally speaking. So it is not in all the situation about making sure that the social enterprise directly is awarded the market or that the social enterprises are gathering together to become a bigger uh, uh, proponent and, and, and thus an attender. These are two very valid options. One, another valid option that we are putting forward is how do we make collaboration between smaller businesses and bigger businesses with experience work? The reason why this is very interesting is because if you think about a small social enterprise winning a tender, it will be uh, very positive for them for the short period of time of the event because they will get uh, some, uh, some uh, income for it. They will grow their team because of it. But on the long term, if they do not have a strong plan to continue with this growth, it can cause a problem. So we also like to foster this relationship between players, between the big one and the smaller one, not only because it gives a safety for the social enterprise, but also because if a social enterprise and a big player are starting to work together, they are high 
chances that they continue working together after the, the Olympic Games because the big supplier will realize that how, how great it is to be working with a social enterprise and how they can benefit from working with social enterprises because then they can propose new services to their client. So the whole ESS 2024 program is built around this. This is built about the amount of a budget that goes to the social enterprise. So it is about, on one side, informing all the local uh, small businesses, all the local uh, uh, social businesses and social enterprise about all the events opportunities that exist. Uh, you know, there is a strong engagement part because a lot of these social enterprise, sometimes they are even against the organization of the games because of the carbon footprint or because of the social impact of this event. So, so the engagement part is very important. Of course, on the other side, this is the informing the ecosystem, but on the other side, we need to do, uh, uh, there's a part of it that is around the sourcing uh, and the support to the event organizer. How do we make sure that we identify the local performing social businesses and the social innovation that are actually able to deliver for the games? and that are actually the solution that can be uh, included into the tenders of uh, uh, you know, the events. Because of course, if the information, if the social innovation is included into the tender, for example, you know, this building needs to be made with recycled material, then it changes totally the amount of money that would go to the to the uh, to the social business ecosystem whether if it does not say anything then the supplier uh, the contractor will not have to do it with recycled material so so having this second part which is really about uh, you know advising the event organizer and the and the and the public uh, uh, organization is is very important and then comes the part of training these social businesses to become event ready. How do you do to, uh, uh, to be, uh, uh, you know, to uh, 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 give your answer to a tender? How do you do to negotiate with the event organizer? And then how do you do to deliver the event? And so this, there is a big cycle of training for all the social businesses so that they become event ready. So this is not about giving them a privilege. This is about giving them all the tools to be ready to be the best. So we are not giving them the market for free. We are saying you will compete with bigger suppliers, so you need to be ready. This is the whole mindset. And finally, you know, this is a lot about facilitating all the collaboration that was, as was mentioning. The collaboration between social enterprises, the collaboration between social enterprises and bigger enterprises with that have a strong, uh, a strong um, uh, experience in event organization. Because at the end of the day, this is all about relationship. This is all about these uh, connection. And this is very uh, uh, successful. In Paris, we are only in the middle of this program, but we have already seen, already seen fantastic results. The first one is that already 150 tenders uh, have been awarded to social enterprises. More than 15% of the volume of the, the tenders, uh, sorry, more than 15% of the, the consortium that have been awarded are including a social business or a social enterprise. And even more interestingly, when you look into the people that are interested by the program, we are more than 3,500 social businesses that are registered onto our platform, which means that are getting the exposure to the fact that the inclusive and sustainable event exists and is happening. And 18,000 people are following our newsletter, which means that people, individuals, are also coming into part of the equation. So I think that here, uh, that I could be speaking an hour more about this program. What is very interesting here is that in Korea, as you may all know, the Gangwon 2024 games are coming up. Uh, and of course, we are more than delighted to be supporting Korea in this endeavor to make sure that the, the Gangwon 2024 games become both inclusive, sustainable, and for the benefit of the local people. 
I hope that was a, a, a good explanation and that you, uh, uh, you will uh, 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 be interested into digging a bit further into this program. I am fully available if you have any question on the ESS 2024 program and please feel free to contact me if this is of any interest on your side. Thank you so much for the invite once again and have a great conference. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. And that was the first presentation. So the public procurement case for the 2024 Paris Olympic Games and uh, social environment problems could be solved by uh, this ESS 2 024. And it was a very interesting case. Uh, we are also going to hold Gangwon uh, Youth Olympic Games uh, in Korea. So, and uh, this project could be related to this. So now we will move on to the second presentation. Uh, we have uh, President Na uh, of the uh, Center for Social Value Enhancement Studies uh, who will present uh, under the theme of uh, addressing social uh, problems uh, with the uh, cooperation of private enterprises and social economy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Na uh, working at the uh, Center for Social Value Enhancement Studies. So please take a look at the uh, subtitle of my presentation, Social Impact Reward Schemes and uh, Their Performance. So this chart uh, shows the uh, social problem uh, in solution in the uh, vertical axis and in the horizontal axis. Uh, we have time. And there are two graphs. Uh, in the top, you see social problems, and in the bottom, uh, you see social uh, problem solution capacities. And the gap between the two uh, is widening because the social problems are increasing exponentially. And what are uh, enterprises doing to uh, solve social problems? Let me show you a few examples. The first, uh, downtown project. Uh, it's an urban regeneration project that started in Las Vegas, uh, initiated by uh, Tony uh, Tony Xie, the CEO of Zappos in 2011. So uh, it was the first example of a business model where uh, a local community and an enterprise uh, work together for uh, innovation and uh, growth. Uh, and there are discussions regarding basic income, uh, which uh, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Elon Musk uh, uh, agree. And there are uh, experiments uh, of basic income uh, with the initiatives uh, called Y Combinator and Economic Security Project. Uh, these are also examples of uh, enterprises' effort to uh, help resolve social problems. Another example is X, X Prize. Uh, it is an NPO uh, uh, that pursues social problem solving with international uh, contest. Now, uh, Elon Musk uh, contributed ten billion dollars uh, to X Prize carbon removal project. Uh, it is a, a project uh, to reward ideas to fight climate change. And uh, what's uh, interesting uh, in this initiative is a uh, focus on a specific environmental issue uh, and a particular technology of carbon capture and storage. Uh, but there is no measuring uh, involved uh, in the project. It's only uh, evaluation. So why are these enterprises working to uh, solve uh, social problems? Uh, it can be summed up into a key one keyword, stakeholder capitalism. Uh, uh, there has been a uh, initiative led by Business Roundtable uh, to move uh, away uh, from a shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Uh, and the initiative was also echoed uh, by Financial Times Chief Economic Commentator Martin Ulf, uh, who uh, argued for a time for a reset. Uh, 
Uh, the, uh, this idea was also adopted by the World Economic Forum. Uh, last year's theme of the forum was stakeholders for a cohesive and sustainable world. In uh, below that, you see the Davos Manifesto 2020. Now, uh, manifesto uh, is a word that's uh, used for uh, a normative framework that is as uh, powerful as a constitution. So the Manifesto 2020 is a universal purpose of a company in the fourth industrial revolution. So it's about purpose of a company, and, and, and it's about universal purpose uh, that applies to all companies around the world. Now, the Davos Forum has about 50 years of uh, history. It was founded in 1970. And in 1973, uh, the Forum uh, announced the Davos Manifesto I. And uh, the manifesto uh, introduced a concept of stakeholders uh, providing a guideline uh, on a future uh, shift. And uh, the Davos Manifesto II uh, was issued in 2020. Uh, and the title is very different from Manifesto One. In Manifesto One, it was about a code of ethics. In Manifesto Two, it's the universal purpose of a company. And uh, in particular, we have to uh, pay attention to the third box in the bottom. A company is more than an economic unit, uh, such a powerful new definition of a company. And it also says performance must be measured not only on the return on shareholders, which is economic return, but also on how it achieves its ESG objectives. Uh, so uh, the manifesto specifically mentioned measurement uh, in its uh, narrative of stakeholder capitalism. And as I will uh, explain more in detail later, uh, there have been many social uh, performance uh, reward schemes regarding uh, the measuring the social performance of uh, companies. So there are many uh, different schemes like PBR, SIB, SII, NC, and SPC. Uh, the first example is payment by result, or PBR. So since there are results, uh, you have to measure it. So uh, in uh, PBR, private entities are paid based on the results they uh, create. And the results uh, have to be measured. And the second example is SIB, or Social Impact Bond. And I think uh, many of you already know uh, about this scheme. Uh, so uh, in Social Impact Bond, uh, the uh, government uh, agrees on social impact uh, targets uh, with a private, inst uh, private entity. Uh, and if the targets are met, uh, the government uh, rewards uh, the investors in their private entity. Uh, and the uh, impact uh, is also uh, measured in the scheme. Uh, so there have been some real examples of SIB. The first one uh, is the Petersburg SIB. Uh, the goal was to reduce the um, re-offense uh, rate of a former prison inmates. So the initial project was successful with about 11% reduction uh, in their reoffense. Uh, and there have been 138 uh, SIB projects so far. And the third one uh, is SBC, or Social Progress Credit. Uh, it is a scheme to measure social performance created uh, by a social enterprise in monetary value and providing cash incentives in proportion. Uh, so the scheme was uh, first applied in 2015, and uh, so far there have been uh, 288 enterprises that created uh, social value or social impact worth 71.4 uh, billion won. So there is measurement involved uh, in cash uh, incentive. 
And the fourth one is social impact incentive, or SIINC. So uh, here, the social impact is also measured and incentives are provided. And what's, uh, what can be more effective uh, is uh, to attract uh, investors uh, for the creation of more uh, social impact. So this scheme uh, started in 2016 uh, by Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation in Roots of Impact. And it was first applied uh, to a project in Mexico. Now, the SIINC is a project-based scheme. Uh, there have been six uh, such uh, projects now in operation, and there's no example in Korea yet. Now this uh, table summarizes and compares the four different schemes. Uh, you can take a uh, closer look uh, after the forum. So what are the uh, implications of these schemes? First, uh, the role of companies uh, is uh, growing in solving social problems. Uh, as you can see from the uh, Davos Manifesto and the uh, SIINC, uh, private companies are uh, crucial in social problems these days. Uh, uh, and a second, uh, measurement is always involved uh, in order to uh, overcome the uh, financial uh, short uh, financial uh, deficit or market failure. Third, uh, these schemes try to induce creative ideas from the uh, private sector. Fourth, uh, the measurement uh, is increasingly focusing on outcome uh, and reward uh, increasingly becoming cash incentive. Fifth, uh, these schemes start uh, by uh, start with uh, individual projects uh, and then try to uh, become institutionalized. Sixth, data and success uh, cases are crucial uh, in order to gain public uh, consensus, but we don't have uh, that many cases. Let's move on uh, to SPC. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a scheme that involves measuring uh, social value uh, in cash, providing cash incentive. Uh, and it also pursues uh, wider membership. So it's been seven years uh, since uh, the SBC project was launched. Uh, and the uh, companies who participated in the project uh, created uh, about 240 billion won in social impact uh, and about four. 45 billion won uh, was provided in cash incentive. So in other words, uh, the uh, multiplier effect of the cash incentive uh, is about six times. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the uh, examples. 4EN, uh, it's a company that utilizes coffee waste uh, in order to produce uh, eco-friendly fertilizers and fuel. Uh, and when you look at the uh, growth rate in social value created by 4EN, uh, it increased at, by 73% annually between 2016 and 2019. Another example uh, is uh, Sankol baby food. So comparing uh, the uh, sales between 2015 and 2019, uh, the uh, annual growth rate uh, is six, 76 uh, percent. Now this uh, chart uh, shows uh, the uh, cash incentives uh, provided uh, to companies creating social value. And we were concerned that the uh, pandemic would actually hamper companies uh, in the social value creation. But that was not true. 
the social value are actually increased uh, with more attention given uh, to companies creating social value. So we provided more cash in incentives. And uh, as I said earlier, we need data and success cases. Uh, and uh, that's why we are uh, conducting academic research and writing papers. Uh, on the left, you see uh, a paper on uh, a business case uh, written by uh, a Harvard professor. So uh, SBC uh, is now studied uh, in Harvard. And on the right, you see uh, an outcome of a co-research with Professor Shin Jae-yong. Uh, the paper is about social uh, performance incentives in mission-driven firms. Uh, and this paper uh, was officially adopted by Management Science, which is one of the top five journals in business management studies. Uh, so uh, we can see that uh, in academia, uh, the uh, effectiveness of SPC uh, is now being actively discussed. Uh, of course, uh, the effectiveness uh, of SPC uh, has to be uh, measured and validated uh, more. I hope you can uh, continue to uh, help us uh, to uh, get, uh, uh, help us to make more uh, progress. Uh, and we are also uh, thinking about an experiment uh, in uh, simulated uh, stock trading, uh, which can contribute to measuring the social value created by companies. And we are also uh, working hard uh, to uh, engage more actors in the project, including local governments and um, fund uh, contributors, uh, including the uh, Korea Deposit uh, Insurance Corporation and Korea Enterprise Data. And we are also uh, conducting research on the social value measurement of social enterprises in China and Japan. And I believe uh, that although we have a long way to go, we are uh, here where history is made. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to quote John Stuart Mill. One person with a belief is equal to a force of 99 who have only interest. I believe all of you here uh, can continue to uh, work with us uh, in creating more social value. Uh, in that uh, way, uh, we can uh, always win or learn, not lose. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, uh, President Nasakwan of the uh, Center for uh, Social Value Enhancement uh, Studies. I uh, hope, uh, as he uh, wished, uh, today's forum can be an opportunity to uh, encourage more and more people in creating more social value. I will uh, invite him uh, again in our discussion session. Let's now move on to the third pr uh, presentation. The topic of the third presentation is addressing social issues through the participation and solidarity of civil society and consumers, and it will be presented by Mr. Andrew O'Brien, Director of External Affairs of Social Enterprise UK. We'll listen to his uh, video. My name is Andrew O'Brien. I'm Director of External Affairs at Social Enterprise UK. It's a delight to be able to speak to you at the Social Enterprise Leaders Forum, and I'm only sorry I can't be there in person, but the pandemic has caused problems for everyone around the world, uh, but it's great to be able to at least virtually have this conversation. Social enterprise in the UK, like across the world, has seen significant difficulties in operating through this pandemic. Uh, but instead of contracting uh, and retreating, as you might expect, given the whirlwind of economic and social impact that we've seen from the pandemic, the social enterprise sector in the UK has actually been thriving and adapting. And it's been able to do that in large part because of the solidarity between government, business, consumers, society and the social enterprise sector. This is, shouldn't be a surprise to us. People love social enterprises. They like the idea of social enterprise, the view that you can use trade to have a positive impact on the environment and on society. 
and social enterprises for many years have been developing loyalties between their customers, their clients and the state to ensure that they can deliver their social and environmental mission. But COVID really tested those relationships. But I'm pleased to say that because of the work of social enterprises, we've been able to get through this. And we've done seen that through three distinct phases. The first has been around uh, what you could call traditional customer and client loyalty. We run a buy social corporate challenge, which has some of the largest companies in the UK buying from social enterprises and putting those social enterprises into their supply chains. And what those companies have done is not to retreat from those relationships, but to keep buying from those social enterprises and finding ways to, to keep spending with them, knowing the value that they create for their communities. And that's because of the hard work and graft that social enterprises have put in to engaging with those corporate suppliers and to some extent the brokering relationship that we here at Social Enterprise UK have been able to deliver. But we've also seen the same happen for individual consumers. People have, when they've been able to go out and spend with social enterprises, try to find ways to make sure their money can go further. And, and social enterprises have been able to continue to keep those relationships with those consumers going through what's been a very challenging economic circumstance. The other way that social enterprises have been able to keep that solidarity is through adaptation. We've seen a huge shift from social enterprises delivering their products through traditional face-to-face -face, uh, or B2B, business-to-business uh, -business relationships to digital delivery. Uh, and you know a large portion of the sector has been able to shift some or all of its activity online to reach more people and to keep those relationships intact. That pivoting uh, away from face-to-face -to, -face to digital during the pandemic has been critical. And some social enterprises will keep that uh, digital aspects of their work going past the pandemic, but others will now, because that's what consumers, that's what their clients want, will now be transitioning back towards face-to-face -to -face activity. And the final element we've been able to do is through support from government. It hasn't been always the easiest relationship during this pandemic. Uh, there were times when it was very hard to get government to understand the unique situation that social enterprises face. But thanks to work from Social Enterprise UK and the sector itself in making that case to government, we've been able to get hundreds of millions of pounds worth of emergency grant support out into the sector to keep those businesses going. We've been able to give tax support to enable social enterprises to keep trading uh, and uh, discounted loans as well to keep that cash flow. And that relationship with the state has been very important during the past 12 months and will continue to be important as we look to build back better from this uh, historic pandemic. But all taken all together, that, that loyalty from customers and clients, that pivoting and adaptability of social enterprises, and, and that emergency support and recognition from the state about the value of social enterprises, taken together, that solidarity has enabled the social enterprise sector to get through that very, very difficult period we just experienced. But going forward, I think, if anything, the bonds between social enterprises, business, society and the state is getting stronger. It's getting stronger in part because of the impact that social enterprises have made through the pandemic. Uh, social enterprises have stepped up where other businesses have not been prepared to do so. They have kept their staff um, uh, in their business uh, and not uh, laid off people that they, they, that if, unless they absolutely have to do so. They've been prepared to invest in, in their people, in their places, uh, to you know, go the extra mile in providing emergency support to families and communities in their area. And that's really shone through and people are starting to recognise the unique power that social enterprises have and their commitment to people and to places. We've also got some systemic economic and social challenges and importantly an environmental challenge. Uh, as you will be aware, this year the COP uh, is uh, COP26 is being hosted in Glasgow in the United Kingdom. And this is bringing together the world leaders to again make fresh commitments to tackle climate change and to move towards uh, a, a zero carbon future. And social enterprises are at the forefront of delivering that. Uh, our first solar powered 
bus in this country was delivered by a social enterprise. We were pioneering sustainable fashion and finding ways to reduce plastics uh, in our supply chains many, many years before the rest of the private sector were doing so. And that long term patient commitment towards tackling those economic and social and environmental challenges is why businesses, governments and society are starting to see the real value in working with our sector. So uh, those combina uh, that combination of pressing social and environmental challenge, as well as the track record that social enterprises have shown, not just during the pandemic, but beforehand as well, but particularly during, particularly during this pandemic, has really created new bonds uh, and new interest in the social enterprise movement. And I think that's not just going to be a phenomenon in the United Kingdom, but will be one in Korea and around the world. Uh, people want to see and feel change and social enterprises are showing how it can be done and are doing it at a level of consistency and success that we're not seeing in other parts of our economy. I suppose my words of advice uh, or tips, uh, if you will, for countries and, and, and people around the world about how to grow their social enterprise sector, uh, I think there are three main uh, ways that you can help to uh, grow and sustain your social enterprise sector through uh, consumer solidarity and business solidarity. Uh, the first I would say is focusing on the impact and the results that your social enterprises are generating. We here at Social Enterprise UK collect a lot of data about social enterprise and that has enabled us to be able to make a really strong case for why social enterprises are so important for our future, whether it's around the net zero and the carbon reductions that we need to see, whether it's around job creation, working in our poorest communities, helping people with disadvantage. We have the data, we have the evidence to show that social enterprises are doing more than other forms of business. And that breeds interest in social enterprise. It encourages people to buy from social enterprises. It encourages people in government and in business to invest in social enterprises and to see the value of our sector. The second thing I would say is to be confident about social enterprise as business. Uh, people are aware that we have huge systemic challenges taking place, uh, not just in the UK, but around the world. And that's going to require huge changes to our economy and to the way that we do business. Um, and pigeonholing social enterprise or putting social enterprise into the box of philanthropy uh, is it diminishes the potential, the transformational potential that this business model can have. So it's really important to make sure that people understand that we are businesses. We are trying to change the world through trade. We are sustainable. Uh, we are people who are going to be here for the long haul. We're not just going to pop up, ask for your money and then disappear in a few years time. We're looking to build businesses which can sustain themselves and thrive and contribute for many years ahead. And that long term vision and that business focus showing that we are focused on our sustainability, that encourages people to stick with you because they know that this is not just another charity appeal. This isn't just another one off. This is really about making huge systemic changes to the way that we do business. And the final element, I guess, is to think more about that digital and advertising and marketing of social enterprise. We are seeing a lot of what you could call social wash or green wash. This is where companies say that they're going to be socially and environmentally impactful. But when you look behind the rhetoric and the words, you can't always see that action. And that in a way is uh, because social enterprises and others have been making such big strides in encouraging consumers to think again about how business should operate and, and what a good business looks like. But we have to adapt to that as well. We have to raise our game and be ever more transparent, uh, ever more vocal about the impact that we have and the importance that businesses follow through with their commitments. So I would really encourage all social enterprises around the world to take the fight to uh, the rest of the private sector, to the government, to the consumers to some extent, and to tell them, you know, if you really believe in social and environmental change, then you have to buy from companies which you can trust and rely on to deliver that. And social enterprises are a primary example of that. They're not the only example, but they are at the forefront of delivering that change. And we need to be calling out those businesses, those policies from government, and sometimes even the 
consumer behavior uh, and the purchasing decisions that consumers are making to say, well, hang on, why are you doing it that way? Do you really know whether that money is going towards uh, making a better future for our uh, for our society and for and to protect our planet you know where is the data where is the evidence around that and and can we showcase how social enterprises really can be trusted to deliver on that agenda so i hope that's a very useful overview of, of some of the ways in which we've adapted here in the uk to the pandemic and looking forward what the story can be for social enterprise uh, but i i look forward to hearing from the rest of you uh, during this forum uh, and i hope that the rest of the conversations go well but thank you very much again for the invitation uh, we stand with you here in the united kingdom in solidarity with our peers in Korea uh, to do this effectively uh, and hopefully we can continue to uh, make progress as a global social enterprise movement towards the social and environmental change that we need to see. Thank you very much. Well, please give a big hand for his presentation. So that was the third presentation and that was delivered by Mr. Andrew O'Brien, Director of External Affairs of Social Enterprise UK. So during the pandemic, social enterprises have been able to survive. Um, and there were many elements that made that uh, available and possible. There have been uh, the solidarity between social enterprises, the government and the civil society. And that was very important. So we have listened to the three presentations. And based on uh, these presentations, we are going to uh, move on to the panel discussion, inviting the panelists and also the uh, speakers. Now, this forum is live streamed uh, on our YouTube channel, and I th there are many uh, participants who are listening in online. And there have been many uh, questions posted, and there were a lot of uh, encouragement, messages of encouragement as well. So thank you very much. and. I would also like to ask for further participation. And the questions will be introduced and answered through the panel discussion. So I'd like to ask for your continued active participation. So we have listened to the presentations. And some of them have been pre recorded. Now we're going to deliver a real time uh, panel discussion. The panelists, the speakers, will be participating both online and offline. And we are also conducting a satisfaction survey. Uh, you can participate by using the QR code or the link. And I hope that you could actively participate in the survey. To, for, to help us prepare a better forum for next year as well. I believe that we are ready to move on to the panel discussion. Now we will move on to the panel discussion. The theme is exploring the paths to strengthen the contribution of the social economy in era of transition. The moderator is Professor Shin Hyung Sang of Hanyang University. Uh, I'd like to ask the moderator and the panel discussants all to the stage. So, uh, we uh, have Mr. Yohan Nogi, a co founder of Unis Sports Hub, joining us online uh, real time. And Mr. Andrew O'Brien of uh, Social Enterprise UK is also uh, joining us online. Uh, today uh, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Yi Chol Chung, CEO of uh, Work. Uh, working together uh, in Ogibo, uh, a managing director of iCoop Korea. Uh, Kang Min Su, the uh, director of policy planning and of the uh, Korea Social Economy Network, and Jong Sun Hee, a uh, director of Cafe O Asia. Please welcome them with a big round of applause. Now, let me pass the microphone to the moderator. Good afternoon. My name is Shin Hyung Sang, teaching at the uh, Business School of Hanyang University. 
First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's a great honor for me to join this conversation. So we have an uh, insightful discussion earlier. Professor Muhammad Yunus uh, talked about the uh, key objectives of social enterprises and their intentions. And Professor Kim Myung Jin uh, talked about how to achieve uh, economy of scale and economy of scope in social enterprise uh, to uh, have sustainability and why digital transformation is important in that process. Uh, and the uh, first presenter, Mr. Uh, Yohan Nugi, uh, talked about the need uh, for partnership and networking involving the public sector in particular and how to create new opportunities uh, taking part uh, in that partnership. Uh, in regarding the uh, partnership between private enterprises and social economy, uh, President Na uh, shared a lot of insights. And recently, you know, the Squid Game is very popular around the world. And uh, you know, uh, it, it's a story of, about a fight uh, for 45.6 billion won. And coincidentally, uh, the uh, SK Group provided uh, the same amount uh, in uh, you know incentive for social enterprise, uh, social uh, value creation. Uh, and the difference is, uh, the Squid Game uh, is a game of win or lose. Uh, but in SBC, uh, it's, a, it's a, a win or learn. So I believe that's a critical experiment for the growth of social economy. And uh, regarding uh, the uh, civil society participation and solidarity, uh, Mr. Andrew O'Brien uh, shared uh, his insights, uh, in particular uh, on B2B and B2C. So in the past, uh, 10 or more years, uh, social enterprises in Korea have uh, evolved uh, very fast, and the challenges they often had uh, was to find sales channels and uh, attracting uh, financing. So when it comes to uh, sales channel, uh, the experiments in the UK and France uh, have uh, significance in regarding financing, uh, SBC, and other uh, similar schemes. Uh, uh, will have uh, significance for our future. Now, I'd like to uh, ask uh, for more insight and wisdom from our panelists. First, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Chung Sun Hee, a director of Cafe O Asia Social Cooperative. I believe that uh, she has prepared uh, key questions for today's speakers. Ms. Chung, can you please go ahead? Good afternoon. I didn't know that I was going first. I was quite surprised. So we have listened to the three presentations under three themes, and, and they were very interesting and impressive. And we could see the development of social enterprises. And I think these themes are very important for the growth of the social enterprises. First, uh, Mr. Yuan Nugia has mentioned about public procurement, which can help solve the social issues. I'd like to uh, give my comments about that. Uh, public procurement is uh, a very strong measure for government to solve social issues. S social environment values are created by uh, social enterprises, and these social enterprises can be uh, taken as partners uh, to resolve social issues. And I think this kind of viewpoint is very important, and a lot of uh, support measures should be provided uh, to engage these social enterprises in public procurement. I think we need to think about these measures in Korea. Uh, when we are talking about social enterprises, uh, most of the support measures were done uh, through financial measures, direct financial measures um, for employment or encouraging the nurturing of the social enterprise uh, members. And market economy 
in terms of market economy, I think that these kind of measures uh, have weakened the capability or the capacity of social enterprises themselves. Now we are seeing some changes these days. But then when we were talking about the government's public procurement, uh, rather than focusing on uh, direct support, we should focus on raising the uh, capability of the social enterprises to su su survive in the market economy. So in that respect, as I listened to the uh, Mr. Yuan Nugie's uh, Paris Olympic related uh, social enterprise encouragement program, I think that was very impressive. So using public procurement for the Olympic Games can be used to uh, nurture uh, the uh, social enterprises. I think that kind of efforts have been applied in the London Olympic Games too. So I think it had helped create uh, jobs and also revitalize uh, local areas. And for the Paris 2024, I think the target, the goal and the aims are larger. And I think that uh, yes, as 2024 is doing a very important role in terms of uh, being an intermediary. So I have two questions. So the financial stability or experience uh, would be the basis for selecting um, the uh, the companies, the suppliers in the bidding. However, the social enterprises are not competent in that respect mostly. So when, so you mentioned uh, the social enterprises becoming the subcontractor of large enterprises, and that could be one model of uh, cooperation between uh, large and small enterprises. So in that way, uh, the social enterprises could be only uh, of playing a very supportive role only. And I wonder if that could have a good impact on the growth of the social enterprises for the long term. Of course, we have to do the design in a, a better way and good way. But then what kind of role does ESS 2025 do uh, in that respect in terms of building good relationship? And if public procurement grows further, it, rather than being seen as an opportunity to enlarge the social enterprise and grow the social enterprise, I think there would be large enterprises just trying to exploit this opportunity. So as we uh, expand the participation of social enterprises in public procurement, maybe there could be some side effects of these uh, other uh, non-participants becoming neglected in that process. So I'd like to know uh, how to address this issue. And the second is about Professor Na Sok Kwan. Uh, in social economy, SK has played a very important role. And social value and measuring the social performance of social enterprises uh, have been suggested. And that could be connected to public procurement. And I think in that paradigm, SK is playing a very important role. But then I have one question in that respect. So this is about public-private company partnership. And partnership has many forms. One. Uh, there is a uh, supporter, and then there is a, the beneficiary, the sponsor and beneficiary. But then the second, there would be a marketing type um, support. And third is about becoming a supplier, as a social enterprise becoming a supplier of a large enterprise. So that would be one form. In Korea, I think we don't have a lot of cases where companies become large companies become a consumer and social enterprises become uh, a supplier. Rather, social enterprises are just the target of philanthropy. So if uh, the social enterprises can uh, become uh, a more competent player, I would like to know what kind of efforts should we make? And third, I have a question to Mr. Andrew O'Brien, the director Andrew O'Brien. 
I was very impressed by your presentation, and uh, you have mentioned about solidarity. And in uh, the pandemic, social enterprises could overcome uh, the crisis because of uh, the solidarity. And I think this is something that we have to focus on. I am in the social enterprise sector too, but when I look around, I see many social enterprises struggling. And uh, you have mentioned that in the UK, social enterprises value have been more well known during the pandemic. So I'm quite interested in uh, the details, how those have been played out. So I'd like to know the details of uh, that aspect. And then about royalty, you have mentioned that uh, social enterprises should not be uh, seen within the framework of philanthropy. They can their potential cannot be well understood. So I think that's very important. And I was impressed by that remark. Um, before, I have conducted a survey on 1,300 citizens of Seoul on their perception on social economy. Most of them saw social economy as a measure to uh, uh, provide welfare or providing a support for the uh, vulnerable group. And they thought that uh, this uh, social economy cannot be sustained without government uh, support. So I think we have to change this perception. Otherwise, I don't think that the loyalty to uh, the social economy or social enterprise concept cannot be sustained. So I want to know how the UK has overcome this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So as the uh, speakers uh, spend some time uh, thinking about the uh, answers, I'd like to first explain uh, how we're going to proceed uh, with the uh, uh, discussion. So we now heard uh, from Ms. Chong Sun Hee who ask questions, and I will uh, ask the uh, speakers to answer the questions uh, right away. And uh, it seems uh, Ms. Ogibok of iCoop uh, also uh, has uh, questions uh, for the uh, speakers, and uh, I will also ask speakers to answer those questions right away. And uh, we also uh, have Mr. Yi Chou Chung from Working Together, uh, who uh, is actually a first generation social entrepreneur uh, with a lot of inter uh, experiences in public procurement. Uh, so uh, after the q and A, I will uh, will listen to uh, a short uh, presentation by uh, Yi Chou Chung. Uh, in let's not. Uh, and after that, I will invite Mr. Kang min -soo from the Korea Social Economy Network uh, for his comments on the uh, future uh, of social economy. And there are some questions from the floor. Uh, so uh, after the uh, panel discussion, I will entertain some uh, of the questions from the floor. Now I'd like to ask Mr. Uh, Yuan Nogie, a co-founder of Unus Sports Hub, to answer the questions. Acting. Uh, uh, and actually, uh, when we uh, when we think about the number of uh, contracting that has been done through these games, uh, this is the, the model that is still the most used. But of course, uh, uh, when we look for maybe bigger tender, larger tender, uh, uh, as you rightly point out, subcontracting from bigger supplier is actually very powerful. If I take the example of, of you know the food that I was giving uh, earlier, 
during the presentation, you know, we need to feed 14,000 athletes. So a small social enterprise could potentially have the, uh, the technical ability to do that, but not necessarily the team already and, you know, and the processes and the, and the strength to do that. Uh, and hiring for five weeks enough people to do that would not necessarily be uh, the best option because they would earn a lot of money, but then they would not have the base business to support this growth on the long term. So in many cases, this collaboration through larger businesses are the best choices. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, so these uh, social business suppliers, they can learn, they can collaborate on the long term as well with uh, on many other tender, much beyond the game. So, so for this reason, the, there are some, some obvious benefits. And regarding your question, maybe what, uh, you know, makes uh, a big supplier continue to work with the social enterprise and not uh, treat the social enterprise just as, a, as an auxiliary uh, for the time of the game. Uh, it's actually uh, something that Andrew was mentioning earlier. Uh, uh, it's not what is written in the contract that is making uh, uh, these two organizations collaborate. It is the great value that the social enterprise is actually bringing. Here again, we are not asking to, to make any preference to social businesses or social enterprise. We are actually helping social enterprise to become undeniably better than their competitor on uh, 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 traditional suppliers. Uh, so, so what I think social enterprise needs, needs to focus on is that, uh, and understand maybe as well, is that they are not necessarily competing with traditional supplier, uh, even if they sell the same product or service, because what social enterprise do sell is social value. And from the moment that, you know, the social business catering company, the, uh, you know, uh, work with, with a bigger supplier, uh, they actually sell inclusion of refugees. They they sell job creation. They they sell you know uh, integration of unemployed people, uh, and 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 from the moment when this value creation becomes the reason for the collaboration with the traditional supplier, then there is no need for giving preference. Uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the, the the traditional suppliers they are craving for what social enterprise social enterprise has to offer. Uh, and uh, and uh, if they want to be able to work with future clients, they also need uh, uh, these social values. So I think that the only thing that helps social enterprise in this case is not necessarily a contract. I mean, this is not something that we are really focus on, focusing on. We are rather focusing on making sure that the social enterprise brings the greatest value uh, to uh, to their partners. Yeah, come somebody. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, President Na Sok-kwan, can you answer uh, the question for you now? So thank you very much, um, Ms. Jung Sun-hee, for your questions. So the relationship shouldn't be uh, uh, just uh, between a uh, philanthropist and a uh, beneficiary. And how? Uh, can we uh, uh, overcome the challenge? So, uh, uh, and as Andrew mentioned, there was the uh, bi-social corporate challenge in the UK, uh, and um, there was another uh, shared prosper prosperity uh, model uh, in the US. So, I believe uh, Korea needs to develop its own uh, uh, such model. And we need to think more about the uh, uh, market mechanism uh, in our social economy. Now, social enterprises pursue two uh, purposes, uh, economic uh, value and social value at the same time. So as suppliers, uh, social enterprises have to always think about uh, the differentiated competitiveness of their products and services. Uh, about uh, the uh, competitive advantage of their products and services over other uh, enterprises in the market. And uh, as for uh, 
institutions that procure from uh, social enterprises, uh, they uh, have to uh, consider nine financial values, not just uh, prices. Uh, looking at the values created by social enterprises as a whole, so I believe both sides have to have a broader view, uh, and that will uh, enable uh, a partnership for shared prosperity between the supplier, the social enterprises, and the uh, uh, buyer. So recently, uh, many enterprises are focusing on ESG in their management strategy. And I believe uh, uh, previously, uh, the competition between uh, for-profit companies and social enterprises uh, was done in an uneven playing field. Uh, but with ESG uh, emphasis, uh, recently I think the playing field is becoming more and more even. And uh, in some uh, aspects, social enterprises actually have an advantage. So I think uh, social enterprises should uh, more actively uh, integrate uh, the e their ESG values in their products and services. I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much uh, for your answer. So we have listened to the answers uh, from Yuan Nogi and Pro uh, President Nasakwan now. Uh, Mr. Andrew O'Brien from Social Enterprise UK, uh, can you answer the, the question for you? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I think uh, I appreciate the panelists' drive to get uh, as much detail out of me as possible, uh, so I'll try to oblige. And, uh, you know, over the course of the pandemic, we've seen awareness of social enterprise increase uh, in the UK to the point now where our, our, a very recent survey we've done has found that uh, roughly uh, two thirds of the population of the UK now know about social enterprise and understand and are aware of social enterprise uh, which is a significant achievement and you know the more that that brand is understood and, and the value of that is understood uh, the better we are able to to spread the word around social enterprise and, and to get more clients and customers into our business models i think in terms of the uh i don't want to give a false impression however about uh, the scale of some of the challenges that were made, mentioned and, and somebody said around the fact that social enterprise is still very much seen as an issue around welfare and, um, you know, dependent on state support. Um, and I think those are perceptions that we really need to challenge. Of course, social enterprises require a partnership with the state. They require a partnership with the private sector as well and private business. Uh, but we don't want to give the impression that we are dependent uh, on that. And just to give some interesting statistics from the UK, and, and I think highlights the point, we need to educate the whole country and the whole world about the way that modern capitalism works. And it works with subsidy all the way through. Um, so to give an example in the UK, I've been doing some calculations on this issue myself in recent months. And you know, the UK private sector, this is not just social enterprises, but all forms of business, uh, are subsidised by around £100 billion by the UK state in wage subsidies, tax reliefs, um, grants and other forms of support. Now, when you think about it, the UK private sector only makes £200 billion profit a year on paper. So that means half of the profit of the entire public uh, private sector in the UK and private business in the UK is actually state subsidised in one form or another. So social enterprises are not unique in needing support and partnership with the states uh, and with other actors. The difference is what are the values that are being created with about it? And I think what all the panelists have shown quite clearly is that it's that value that we're creating um, above and beyond the business itself, but in terms of the employment opportunities, in terms of the environmental impact, connecting communities, building social cohesion. That's what we add as additional value. So what we're saying is if you want to leverage the most out of your money, you know, whether you're a consumer, whether you're the government, whether you're a private client or a private business, social enterprise is the way to invest. The social economy is the way to invest in delivering that. And you will get maximum value for money in that process. We need to keep getting better at measuring that. We need to get better at explaining that. Um, but what we shouldn't be ashamed of is the fact that, yes, we do work with the state, we do require private investment, we do require state investment, we do require loyalty from our consumers. 
but that, that we're getting maximum value for that. And one final bit in terms of the detail on that, that question was asked earlier. Um, I, I've been looking into something for a while now, and I think it's probably similar in Korea, but I think it's around the world. You know, there are different way, uh, different uh, customers are prepared to pay different prices for different products, uh, for, sorry, for the same product, um, depending on what they perceive the value of that product to be. That's kind of basic economics. And I think what we tend to think about in that sense is around the value just purely to the customer themselves, their own status, their own personal interest or utility, for want of a, of a better word. But there's also something emerging which I call the social premium um, or social value, you might want to say. And that's that people are prepared to now pay additional money for a product if they perceive that to have a positive social and environmental benefit. And that boosts, obviously, the balance sheet of the company that's doing that, but it also helps to, uh, in, in, you know, raise productivity, raise investment. Um, and we've just done a survey uh, in collaboration with a private company here in the UK, and what they found, and um, we're releasing that this morning, and, and what we found is that customers, particularly the youngest customers, so people under the age of, of 25, are willing to pay 12% more for a service from a social enterprise or a social business than they are from another business. So think about that in broad terms, you know, that's a significant additional cost burden or a price that people are willing to bear if they feel they're getting that social value, that social premium. And there is a battle now taking place, I think, not just in our career, but around the world, in all parts of our economy, around where that premium, where that value will get extracted. You know, will that social premium be taken out from society and just go into traditional private profit, as Mohammed Yunus said at the start, um, or, or are we going to see that premium, that additional value being recirculated, recycled back into the, the economy, back into society, back into protecting the planet and climate change? Um, and and uh, that's what social enterprises are trying to do. We're trying to draw as much of that premium as possible um, and to prevent the, the social wash, the greenwashing that might take place in the private sector um, unless we have a viable alternative way of doing business and a viable, viable way of running our economy. So it's, it's a fascinating time to be working in this sector. Um, and there's, there's a huge amount of solidarity and collaboration required, not just within countries. And we're very happy to talk with colleagues in Korea about the bisocial corporate challenge. And if you are interested in setting up such a scheme, how it could be done, um, but also internationally as well. Um, and how do we build stronger global links to different parts of the social economy? I, I'd love to see more social enterprises buying from social enterprises in Korea uh, and, and likewise, you know, our products and services going back the other way, reinforcing each other and building that inter, uh, international and global solidarity that we need if we're going to transition. Uh, so I hope that's a useful answer to, to, to my fellow panelists' question. Yeah, Thank you very much, Ms. O'Brien, for your answer. I think, you know, uh, good questions uh, lead to great answers. Once again, I'd like to thank Ms. Chung Sunny for your questions and uh, thank the speakers for their great answers. So, uh, Ms. O'Brien uh, talked about uh, uh, social washing or ESG washing uh, briefly. Uh, and um, that's why it's critical for us to measure uh, social value. I believe uh, Ms. Ogi Bok uh, prepared some questions regarding this issue. So she works at uh, ICU. Uh, personally, ICU is one of my favorite uh, companies, uh, and I uh, always try to learn from ICU, a consumer cooperative. And I heard that recently, ICU is working hard to uh, cut uh, carbon emissions, engaging consumers. So uh, please uh, tell us a little bit about that campaign and ask your questions. I'm Ogi Bok from iCoop. Thank you for your presentation. Since I'm in the consumer cooperatives, I'm quite interested in the director Andrew O'Brien's uh, talk because he mentioned about the consumer response. And as the moderator has 
said, as we try to resolve social issues, ICUBE has always been thinking through what kind of things we have to do. Uh, from decades ago, we have been focusing on agricultural farming issues or the uh, food safety issues. And now, from 10 years ago, I th uh, climate change responses have been the focus. What kind of things our consumer cooperatives have to do? And internally, where we, ha we are a network of 177 corporations. So all these, uh, every of the 177 network would have different uh, preferences or priorities. Some would say that farming is the most important. Some would say climate change or environmental issues would be the most important. So when so we had to come to a consensus among uh, our internal 177 members to come up with the priority list so internally we have come up with a consensus that we have to uh, first address the plastic issues in order to overcome the uh, global uh, climate risk so so that is uh, the consensus that we have come up to. And uh, we had to go through a long and arduous process to come up with this consensus. And then as we entered the implementation stage, we have also been facing a lot of challenges. So I will be asking question on uh, related to this uh, later on. Uh, so we are talking about carbon, carbon net zero issues. But if we have to address the plastic issue, I think we have to deal with the production and distribution uh, processes as well. So what kind of cooper things should cooperatives uh, should do to measure and identify the problems and overcome the problems? And uh, if we are addressing the carbon issues, what kind of impact would that have on our brand value? So these had to be all considered as we embarked on this process. For example, there is uh, the water bottle in front of your table. And this is also something that we had to consider. Well, plastic uh, water is produced uh, in a large amount. In Korea, uh, every year, a person would be drink using 96 bottles of uh, drinking water. So how can we reduce this? Well, one can use a tumbler and not buy uh, plastic bottled water. But then in the market, what happens? So, but the plastic would be very hard to replace because uh, average uh, private companies would be uh, producing plastic bottles for water. So how can we reduce the number of uh, plastic bottles? How can we replace the plastic bottles? And one alternative would, had come up, and that was the uh, paper pack, paper pack that could replace the plastic bottle. But then there was one uh, consideration as well. So let's say we can replace uh, plastic with uh, paper, and then we can reduce the total amount of plastic bottles. But then uh, the paper itself is also uh, used for one time, so that is disposable. So that's also a problem again. Then. What is better than natural gas? I think, well, I think natural gas is uh, better than oil, but it's not better than re uh, renewable energy. So uh, I think maybe uh, we can't say that A, uh, for example, A would be better than any other things when we are dealing with social issues. So uh, we had to think a lot about how to address those uh, social issues in which ways. So we are trying to change the way we think about how to address the social issues. So well, social enterprises are small in general. And that's what everybody say. And you, uh, there was also a mention about a 365 athlete program in the presentation and public procurement uh, social enterprise uh, uh, 
processes and projects uh, can be done. But I don't think that this could be done alone by social enterprise sector. I think laws and regulations have to be in place. Social value can be should be measured. And that's, this is uh, something related to the question that I would like to ask to Mr. Yuan Nugie. So what is the best policy, best government policy to uh, support public procurement? You ha are doing the uh, 365 athletes uh, support process. So uh, do, you do you actually have a very good process to um, provide support um, to the social enterprises? Is there a government procurement? system, a good system to uh, provide the support. And the second is to uh, President Na Seok Won. And it was a very impressive presentation. And I, I did mention the case about ICOOP. I think internal consensus is very important and, and that's very hard. A cost can be incurred and also brand value could be impacted. And that could also impact uh, the business uh, value and process. So I think we had to cover all that to come up with a decision, but I don't think this is an isolated case for iCoop. So you're mentioning ESG. So within social economy, uh, the social issues could be diverse. So within that social economy, uh, could you mention what kind of ESG management cases are? And uh, if there had been any social value that had been created and that had uh, improved the business uh, brand value uh, in return, could you provide any cases of that? And of course, uh, we are talking about stakeholder uh, value, but then uh, we need to think about the laws and regulations related to the stakeholder uh, value. Of course, the private companies like SK is providing a lot of efforts, but I do think there is a limit to uh, creating a laws and regulation environment uh, in that direction. So what kind of things are there? So that's the question I'd like to ask to Professor Na. And then to uh, President, uh, Director Andrew O'Brien, you had mentioned about the first um, uh, photovoltaic bus. Um, so I would like to know, is, uh, you had mentioned that that was the first one. Is that because, uh, is that uh, the, the, the business model of the, uh, the bus company or uh, is it based on the technology that had made it available? And now we are also talking about sustainable fashion. And that uh, is that related to the plastic issue? And third question is, so we are trying to reduce the uh, plastic bottles. Is there any similar case in the UK as well? Well, iCube has uh, thinked through a lot of uh, concerns. Internal consensus was hard to come, but I think social consensus would be uh, harder to come up with. So if it is measured, the social value is measured properly, then I think uh, the social economy's value could be uh, measured uh, properly as well. So I think laws and regulations Regulations have to be in place, and uh, we also have to think about the ESG model. And third, we can think about the uh, first uh, photovoltaic bus and the uh, fashion as well. So if you could all provide some uh, concrete examples, uh, I would like to appreciate that. Thank you very much for the question. So we're uh, now going to uh, ask uh, Mr. O'Brien to answer first, uh, and after that, Mr. Uh, no get to answer uh, the questions. For your information, Mr. O'Brien uh, has to leave uh, at uh, 4.30 uh, Korean time. Uh, that's why I'm asking him to answer first. Please go ahead. Thank you. Apologies for having to leave a bit early, but uh, it's been a really interesting discussion so far. Um, in terms, I'll start with the bus because it's fun. Um, the bus, um, the technology we need to tackle climate change uh, already exists. And uh, so there's no technological barriers to this. Uh, I think what the question hinted at is the truth, which is that it's an issue around business model. Um, you know, far too many companies are waiting for 
you know, either the cost of technologies to come down in price further so they can, you know, enhance their profit and their margin, or they're just waiting for other people to do it. Um, and what this social enterprise, and it's not a big company, it's in Brighton, uh, which is called the Big Lemon, because uh, it's bright yellow uh, colour. Um, and uh, what the, uh, the this, this very small social enterprise decided to do was they weren't going to wait for somebody else to do it. You know, they were going to go away and actually just implement this technology themselves, even though yes it wouldn't generate them a lot of money it wasn't going to make huge profits uh, but it was going to provide an important service transport to the local community and it was going to protect the planet and um, it's become very popular locally um, there are other companies now experimenting with uh, photovoltaic panels and, and solar power um, so it, you know it really is a pioneer and i think that's where you know we need to see more social enterprises taking a risk and you mentioned sustainable fashion i think as well um, we have a number of companies uh, in the UK which are taking uh, products which would have gone to landfill and turning them into, you know, luxury fashion items in some cases being exported around the world now. Um, so uh, there, there is no reason why we as social enterprises can't pioneer that, that green transition. In terms of consumers, um, I mentioned in my previous question you know the growing awareness and, and the willingness to in some cases even pay more than the asking price or the, or the going price for for products and services that are sold by social enterprises i think for consumers though there is a growing confusion about what is the most responsible way to shop um, and i think there are two elements to this i think of course there's an element of we need to measure our social value better but uh, and, and, and our social impact better and demonstrate that impact better. Um, but we also have to realize that, that we do risk therefore con confusing consumers. You know, if I here in the UK am telling you that I've generated certain amount of social value or social impact, and then there's another company in the UK saying it's de delivered more social impact. There's no regulation in this space in the UK, and I'm not sure if it, there is in Korea, but certainly in the UK, there is no regulation. So, Who's to test those numbers? Who's to test the veracity of that? Um, um, and we also have, and even in some cases in the UK, companies which are running campaigns which are very similar to campaigns that are being run by social enterprises, but are not quite as effective. So to take one example, um, uh, there is a social enterprise, and I noticed you mentioned uh, water um, bottles uh, at, your, at your conference on your tables we have a social enterprise water provider called blue water now this company uh, if you buy water from them a hundred percent so all the profit from that purchase goes to water aid a charity which helps to provide water to people in africa who need it we now have another company who i won't name for for, for legal and reputational reasons who've set up a new brand um, and what they say to their customers is we will give a portion, note, a portion uh, of their profits to Pump Aid. Very similar charity, doing very similar work, but not 100%, not quite the same level of commitment. We have no way of tracking how much is actually going there. So Baloo Water, the social enterprise, you can go on their website and see how much money they've given. I think they've given over £1 million to water aid over their lifetime. So you can see directly as a consumer, in the case of the other company, they're, they're kind of, they've even branded the same color as the social enterprise water that they're competing with. You know, they're basically relying on consumers to go, oh, well, that's very similar to a social enterprises, a social enterprises, and I'll buy from that. And that's the kind of situation that we're getting into. And we do need to get better regulation and more uh, uh, capacity in the space. But the other thing as well we need to, to do, I think, is to really enhance the value of social enterprise as a legal uh, uh, structure, as a form of business. Because we can't expect cons consumers to go away and you know, read through everyone's accounts and you know all their impact reports to find out what's right and what's wrong. They do need to trust that you know if they're buying from a certain type of business that they're getting something. And in the UK, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you're a cooperative. We have a very proud cooperative movement in the UK, uh, and people know when they buy from a cooperative 
what a cooperative is and how it works and the fact that the money is not going out to private profit it's being given to the members of the company or recycled back in the community and we're trying to do the same thing in educating people on social enterprise and i think that's the future really we need people to get social enterprise associated very very strongly with that trust on social impact so that people can then you know the simple question becomes not oh god i've got these two products how can I measure the social impact between them? But they always know that if they're buying from the social enterprise, they're getting the most impactful, socially, environmentally, uh, economically sustainable product. Uh, and that's just instant. And they don't have to worry about that. They can trust that. And that's the direction I think we need to move towards in the sector. So, uh, and I think if we can do that, and, and our evidence suggests from our research that consumers are getting more and more aware of what social enterprise is, as I said, and, and the values that are behind it, Hopefully, we can make that a really, really simple choice for consumers, enhance the market for social enterprises and, and bring some really positive impact. So, um, yeah, from buses to water, uh, there's a, a lot of battlegrounds for social enterprise, uh, both in Korea and the UK and around the world over, over the coming years. Yeah, Andrew, over uh, Isanjim, uh, John, Well, thank you very much. Uh, Director Andrew O'Brien, and thank you again for sharing your insights. And next, I would like to uh, turn the microphone over to President Na. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Ogibok uh, just asked the very meaningful questions. So, uh, first of all, it was about uh, ESG uh, cases in uh, social enterprises. So when it comes to uh, for-profit enterprises, uh, the uh, social value uh, is not integrated in their business model uh, internally. For example, a battery uh, manufacturer or semiconductor manufacturer are not eco-friendly businesses uh, themselves. Uh, and with the emphasis on ESG, they are trying to integrate uh, these uh, this in their behavior. Uh, in contrast, social enterprises were founded uh, to create social value from the beginning. So for social enterprises, it would be much easier uh, to integrate ESG values in their operation. Uh, for example, 4EN, which was also mentioned in my presentation. This company uh, creates eco-friendly fertilizer and fuel with coffee waste. And they partnered with a large business called SK Energy uh, and entered the Myanmar market. And bioecofuel was uh, developed in, uh, from this partnership. Uh, it was recognized as a clean development mechanism by the UN, uh, making profits. So starting from social value, evolving to economic value. And there's another company called Star Stacks. So, uh, you know, uh, starfish uh, is actually what is often avoided by fisher uh, fishermen. Uh, and this company is using starfish, uh, starfish uh, to produce uh, the materials to uh, uh, facilitate uh, snow to, uh, and ice to uh, melt uh, down uh, in an eco-friendly manner, and this uh, this material is being sold to many markets across the world. Uh, so there are many uh, cases uh, of social enterprises uh, where social value uh, is leading to uh, economic value. And there is a question about uh, loopholes in the uh, legal uh, and institutional framework in measuring uh, ESG. Now, ESG uh, uh, is a set of criteria to uh, uh, measure non-financial performance of enterprises. And um, so far, ESG uh, is understood uh, more as a normative index rather than a hard, uh, hard rule, a uh, hard norm. Uh, it's more about a soft norm. Of course, there are some people pursuing uh, institutionalizing uh, ESG in law, but I believe that we need to first identify uh, ESG index and 
based on internal discussion, as you mentioned, uh, set priorities. Uh, in other words, we have to create our behavioral norms or rules in our ecosystem first. Uh, it's uh, not always desirable to just uh, you know integrate ESG into law because once it's uh, in the law, it it would be difficult to roll back uh, if we have problems. And I think the younger generation uh, have more uh, interest in ESG. Uh, uh, I think uh, we can uh, also think about an initiative like a, a regulation sandbox to allow for more social value creation. Well, thank you very much. Next, I'd like to ask uh, co-founder Yuan Nugie to give the answer. Yes, indeed. Um, you know, to, for, for this question, I, I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, because this is a, a very large topic where there is very extensive uh, uh, answers to how can a government uh, uh, be able to, to support such a system, you know, such, uh, um, uh, such programs. I guess that maybe, uh, so my question, my, my answer to the question will not be didactic. I will not give you uh, the answer of, of explaining a step by step, but my, my answer will rather be conceptual. I think that the best system is the one, as I was mentioning earlier, that does not necessarily give an advantage just because uh, the, uh, the social enterprise is a social enterprise. So not making a preference to social enterprise but rather supports the process of increasing the competitiveness of the whole sector uh, of specific social enterprises, of course, because, uh, you know, we need to go uh, uh, step by step and by priority. But I think that, uh, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the key. Uh, it's not about uh, contracting social enterprise because they are social enterprise. It's really about uh, uh, making sure that uh, uh, we are making them more competitive that we are helping them to, to fight with the same weapons as traditional businesses. You know, in, in social businesses, there is business in the world social business. Uh, so that is really what it is about. You know, this is uh, uh, making sure that, uh, uh, that uh, business competition is respected and that the objective of, of the government as, uh, you know, as uh, the, uh, uh, the, the managers of our society uh, are the right ones because mechanically uh, we will have an impact on how social enterprises are, are getting uh, contracted through these kind of programs. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so those were not easy questions, but the three speakers have given us a very detailed and very good answers. Thank you very much again. Next. Uh, I've just mentioned uh, about Mr. Yi Chung, who is the first generation of our social enterprises, and uh, he has a lot of uh, thoughts on B2G, which is related to public procurement. So uh, we'll like to listen to his idea and his insights on how our social enterprises can overcome this trend. Yeah. Good afternoon, I am Yi Chul Chung, uh, the uh, CEO of Working Together. Next month, uh, we'll celebrate the 19th anniversary since its foundation. I don't feel that uh, we are that old, but as I listen to the uh, cases in the uh, presentations, I, uh, I feel that uh, we have been uh, many things uh, in the last 19 years. So there are some uh, cases in France. And uh, in listening to that, I actually thought of the case of London Olympics. You know, many uh, people wanted to uh, benchmark and learn from the London Olympics uh, for our uh, Pyeongchang Winter Games in 2018. However, Uh, you know, social enterprise was uh, very much rejected uh, from preparing for the uh, Pyeongchang Winter Games. 
it was a disaster, uh, if I may. So we have to uh, reflect on, on the failure uh, in the uh, public procurement for the uh, Pyeongchang Winter Games. Uh, last year, uh, the uh, public procurement market uh, was about 17.5 trillion won uh, of five, uh, 50. Uh, so the public procurement market in Korea last year was uh, 175 trillion won, uh, and the annual budget of the central government uh, is about 500 trillion won. But uh, social enterprises only account for uh, one percent, uh, less than one percent uh, of the public procurement. Uh, so now there are procurement market uh, and there are uh, uh, commissioned projects by local governments uh, and there are voucher uh, based uh, market which amount to about 20 trillion one uh, and there are social uh, responsibility uh, budget uh, run by uh, public institutions and semi semi public uh, institutions um, in the social economy uh, accounts for uh, less than 10 percent uh, in these uh, markets uh, where uh, social enterprises have to actually play a much more uh, active role. So today I think uh, the discussions we uh, have had uh, it are leading to uh, the uh, 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 the opportunity to think about the challenges we have uh, in public sector, private sector, and social economy. So when it comes to public contract, uh, we talk about uh, transparency, uh, legal legitimacy, uh, and fairness. So these three principles sound very good, but they can actually uh, uh, work not, um, they uh, cannot function very well uh, when they are uh, institutionalized in a bureaucratic way. Uh, these uh, values uh, won't actually serve uh, public good or social value. Now, there are National Contract Act or Local Contract Act and there was only one article uh, that was amended uh, in the uh, current administration uh, that allows uh, for uh, a closed uh, closed uh, bid uh, contract uh, for uh, social enterprises. Now, this article uh, is very uh, paternalistic or charity-minded uh, uh, approach to social enterprises. And in general, there are still uh, two uh, barriers. Uh, first of all, uh, eligibility uh, to participate in the bidding. Uh, uh, and second, uh, uh, competencies. First, eligibility. Now, social enterprises are actually optimal uh, entities uh, to uh, actually implement public initiatives. Uh, in in uh, Seoul, in uh, the surrounding areas, many social uh, cooperatives are increasingly being commissioned uh, for initiatives. Uh, by uh, local governments, and what's the reason for that? As mentioned by uh, President Mohamed Yunus, social cooperatives can solve the problem of concentration of profit in many of the uh, initiatives uh, conducted by uh, public institutions. Social cooperatives uh, have the structure uh, that 
will prevent such concentration of profit. However, we are yet to institutionalize uh, the uh, advantages that the social cooperatives have in this respect in the broader public procurement market. For social enterprises to have a meaningful portion in the public procurement market, we need to revise the National Contract Act and the Local Contract Act uh, so that social enterprises uh, can be given a fair uh, opportunity. They shouldn't be regarded uh, as just some vulnerable economic entities to be supported. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, the principles for public contract uh, should be based on the assumption that social enterprises are actually vital and integral in uh, public initiatives. So there were our concerns about social washing or uh, green washing. And uh, in order to dissolve such concerns, we need to create successful cases that show uh, that social uh, social economy is crucial uh, in uh, solving social and environmental problems. Uh, in a meaningful way. The problem is that uh, many uh, social uh, economy organizations uh, are dependent on public subsidy. But uh, instead, we have to create more successful cases. Uh, with those cases, we will be able to gain the public support uh, for uh, recognizing social enterprises uh, as legitimate entities to participate in public contracts. So this is uh, a challenge that still still remains. Uh, moving on to uh, responsible consumption or uh, solidarity consumption. Uh, I don't actually want to, you know, uh, criticize consumers. I believe the problem is more in distribution. No, there were some uh, some cases uh, regarding SK's contribution, and in in the Korean market, distribution uh, is dominated by large businesses, and that's why they uh, have many opportunities to work with social enterprises. Of course, they can provide cash and incentives. However, they can do more than that. The large businesses can provide more uh, opportunities, better opportunities for social enterprises in their platforms and distribution channels. And uh, such uh, in initiative uh, shouldn't be just one off. Uh, it should be more about uh, establishing a stable area uh, for. Uh, social enterprises to continue to uh, provide social values and economic values at the same time for consumers. So that way I believe we will be able to uh, improve the public uh, perception of social enterprises as welfare providers. So uh, these are the uh, some uh, of the thoughts uh, that occurred in uh, my head as I listened to their presentations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So as I listened to your comments, um, now I think that uh, it's win or learn rather than win or lose. As uh, President Na Sok Kwan has mentioned, we had struggled during the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games, but we have learned from our failure. And we have also uh, seen the lessons and the, uh, the outcome from the 2024 uh, Paris Olympic Games preparation process. So I think that will be very helpful. So the social economy organization 
Christians should not be uh, the target of uh, charity. We have to be treated as equal partners. So rather than just providing subsidies to us, uh, we should be able to participate as equal partners. And also, we should be able to have build more competitiveness uh, to participate in the public procurement uh, area. So I think that has uh, been very impressive uh, for me. And uh, social economy should not be uh, given priority just because there are social uh, enterprises uh, to win contracts. And uh, we can learn the lessons from the 2024 Paris Olympic Games procure public procurement process. And I think that would build a very good knowledge base for us as well. And then also, I think we have the power of solidarity and we have to stand up as an equal partner. And in that respect, I think we should invite uh, Director Kang Min Su of Public Policy Planning of Korea Social Economy Network to listen to his insights. Uh, he will be delivering us uh, his insights on uh, the identity of social enterprises and the future direction as well. I'd like to ask for your comment. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Kang Min Su, the uh, uh, policy planning director of Korea Social Enterprise, uh, Social Economy Network. To introduce my organization a little bit, uh, it's a network of uh, social economy organizations in Korea. Uh, we have 56 uh, members. <laughs> So actually, I'm the last person uh, on the panel to speak, and I was a bit concerned. I was concerned because uh, maybe all the points I wanted to mention uh, can be uh, raised earlier by other members of the panel. But fortunately, I still have some points to raise. Uh, in 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 a po uh, in a sense, this is unfortunate because I wanted to talk about the identity of social uh, economy mostly, uh, and that was not really uh, part of the focus in today's discussion. So, what I'm going to talk about right now could be a little inconvenient for you, but I think we have to uh, consider this. So with the word identity, what do you uh, think of? So uh, it's about ESG uh, management. So ESG was mentioned a lot today. And um, I think we uh, talked uh, quite a lot about uh, the ENS uh, in detail, and there were some cases presented, but uh, I am not sure whether we all understand G properly. So E is environment, S is social, but what does G stand for? It's not game, of course. If we do not discuss the G in ESG, we cannot achieve ESG, you know, it's E, S, and G, not e, just E and S. Without uh, discussing governance, we cannot make organizations democratic. Environmentally and socially aware procurement doesn't automatically make our enterprises democratic. So I really believe that we should be more serious on governance. Maybe we can call it GSE instead of ESG because we lack this uh, discussion on G. So democracy within organization, organizations have to be discussed. Can we really create social value just having the CEO making all the decisions and uh, you know uh, having employees following that person. We can create an enterprise where all employees 
uh, make a decision together or uh, make uh, organizational structures of Mondragon, for example. I believe that efficiency and democracy can go together uh, in organizations. And we need to think more about how to uh, achieve that balance. You know, many people uh, talk about social washing, uh, and I believe uh, that we can also use a term uh, governance washing if the organizations are not democratic enough. So there can be many washings uh, regarding ESG. So that's the uh, first point I wanted to mention today. And if G is omitted in ESG in a meaningful, uh, you know, in our practice, uh, the whole uh, concept of ESG uh, can be meaningless. The second point I'd like to raise is a problem uh, regarding the role of social economy in Korea. Now, as uh, Ms. Chong Sun Hee uh, mentioned regarding the uh, uh, survey on uh, social economy, social economy is understood as as a sector to provide social services or uh, cr uh, create uh, employment for vulnerable people. Uh, there are some terms like work integration and social enterprise. But I think social economy uh, is a sector organized voluntarily by participants, uh, ensures equality of members, pursues uh, autonomy uh, from state, uh, and uh, pursues social solidarity. Uh, that's the definition I believe in, and I think the social economy sector in Korea should follow uh, that definition in its, its actual roles. However, uh, the legal and institutional framework in Korea still have a very narrow understanding of social economy. So it's more uh, about uh, employment creation for vulnerable groups. Uh, social economy should be a problem solver uh, regarding climate change, and other uh, social problems uh, as a well. whole. The legal and in institutional uh, framework has to change, and the social economy actors ourselves uh, have to uh, pursue those changes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You have made very important points. If I may add an inconvenient uh, truth, maybe. Well, I sometimes send my students to work for uh, social organizations, but sometimes the students get disappointed because of the governance issue. Since the value is the most important in the social enterprises, the governance is not done properly, and they are maybe imposing some values onto the students only, so the communication is only one way. Maybe this is related to the Korean traditional culture or the generational gap. Um, maybe Korea society has this patriarchal uh, uh, culture. But now the new generation is called the MZ generation, and they are different from the uh, older generations. So I think we have to think about those generational gap issues as well and the culture issues. So we have listened to very good comments and insights, and uh, that gave us food for thought for further uh, discussions now. But however, we have to conclude our session. Uh, but uh, last but not least, I would like to ask uh, a director, Yuan Nugie, to give his comments on what kind of thoughts he had as he uh, participated in the forum. And also, I'd like to ask uh, President Nasokon and the panelists also to give their thoughts one by one. So first, I would like to ask uh, director, Yuan Nugie, to give your uh, comments. Thank you for part your participation. And could you give your uh, comment? Yes, of course. I mean, first of all, I, I was delighted to be a part of this discussion that were really fruitful and very interesting. Uh, it's always uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, to see what uh, what is up happening in Korea. We are we have already uh, some uh, some uh, 
operations in Korea. So, so, so this is a, a country that is dear to, to, to the, the mission that we are having. As regards maybe some of the comments to, uh, to conclude from my side, we've been talking a bit about, you know, uh, how, uh, how much uh, uh, public procurement uh, and uh, big events are able to, uh, to contract social enterprises, whether it is 2.5%, whether it is 10%, whether it is 25%. Don't get me wrong, this number is of course very important. And as much as possible, all the public policies should try to set uh, uh, and raise their standards and enforce this, these standards afterwards. But I think that focusing on this number is somehow taking the problem the wrong way. Because this number, whether it is 2%, whether it is 1%, whether it is 10%, is just a consequence. It gives us a sense of what are the priorities of our societies. So my worry would not necessarily be how we enforce 10%, you know, how do we, do we say that it will be 10% and how we enforce it? But the question is rather, why are we not at 10% yet? Uh, and I think that this, uh, as a, for me, it's an important concluding word because uh, uh, what is behind this number, what is the main driver behind this number is actually the goal that we set ourselves as a society. And as a government, you know, whether it is France, whether it is Korea or any other government. If all of a sudden tomorrow we set the target uh, as a society that we want to reverse climate change by 2025, you know, it's in four years, so there's, there will be a lot of work. Uh, it will not be 2.5% of, uh, of social enterprise that we are going to, uh, uh, to contract through government, uh, you know, through public procurement. It will be mo much more than that. Not because we have no choice and because we are forcing social enterprises, but because social enterprises are the best partner to reach these goals. So I think that rather than, you know, focusing more on the number is what are the goals that we're setting for our society that we need to, you know, to, to uh, you know, from, a, from a, an ESG perspective. And how do we, uh, uh, you know, reach these goals? And, and mechanically, we will get, you know, this number up uh, just because the social enterprise, the social businesses will be the only option, will be the, the best option to reach these goals. So. You know, when, when we, we change this mindset, you know, when we turn the problem around, uh, we will change everything. We will change the way we do procurement. Uh, the, you know, the 10% of such enterprise will not be seen as an obligation, but rather as a leverage, uh, because what we will have in our procurement policies is uh, not the price as the, you know, the, the, the more important factor of decision, but maybe CO2 reduction, you know, and then, uh, of course, uh, 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 social enterprises will be in a better position. Uh, uh, so, so, so it is important once again, you know, I, and I, I, you know, I'm taking the risk of repeating myself, but if we try to, to contract social enterprises because they are the best option uh, and not because we have to reach 10%, we, uh, you know, uh, uh, these 10% will become a logical consequence. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nogie. Uh, once again, I'd like to uh, wish uh, a great success for your involvement in the Paris Olympics uh, and your continued uh, cooperation with us. Now, President Na, please go ahead. So, uh, as I listen to the discussion of uh, other members on the panel, I have to mention the word ESG again. And as Mr. Kang just said, uh, we uh, lack discussion uh, on governance. Uh, and that is true. And uh, at the same time, many enterprises are uh, realizing that the discussion on uh, governance uh, have, to, uh, have to be uh, done uh, if we are to have success in social and environmental aspects. And I believe that uh, the emphasis on ESG uh, will 
uh, create advantages uh, for social enterprises and to uh, utilize those opportunities uh, the most. Uh, the partnership between social enterprises and big businesses have to be formed. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm going to ask the uh, uh, discussants to make closing comments. Uh, Mr. Kang, can you go first? Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this uh, forum. Well, and um, I apologize for not being very uh, interesting in my discussion. So I believe uh, the forum uh, was a great uh, venue uh, to raise awareness and on all three elements of E, S, and G. And I uh, hope we can work together uh, for social economy to uh, serve uh, as an innovator for the entire economy. Thank you very much. So Mr. Kang said, uh, uh, that uh, uh, his uh, key message could be inconvenient for uh, the audience, maybe, but I think that was a valuable contribution. Mr. Richard Tung, can you go now? Thank you very much. Uh, let me take a point uh, and add on uh, to the uh, remarks from Mr. Kang. Now, welfare, education, culture, safety, the environment, and housing are six main areas of work uh, for local governments. And I believe all these uh, areas of work uh, can work properly with sound governance. You know, whenever there is an accident or, you know, scandal, it's, it's an uh, issue of governance. So you could pursue E and S in all these areas of work, but if you don't have sound governance, any initiative on social or environmental aspect are not sustainable. That is why I believe uh, social economy or social enterprises uh, should be uh, should be uh, recognized uh, better because they have uh, sound governance uh, from the beginning uh, in uh, government procurement and I believe uh, that will actually drive better performance in social and economic uh, aspects of uh, local government. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you have shared your experience of uh, 10 years, and thank you very much for that. And next, uh, Ms. Ogibo. Well, we have been discussing very large concepts within a short time. I think there were many things that we need to discuss further. So I think maybe we could discuss about the next time. And you, uh, Mr. Kang has mentioned about that importance of G. And I think we have to focus on G in our next discussion. And we talk about social economy. And President Na has already mentioned about this. You have mentioned that the social economy already have a value internalized inside. So we are speaking of the social economy organizations. However, in the public procurement uh, sector, uh, we also need to have competitiveness on top of that. But then uh, maybe we are, we are also saying that the percentage, the numbers itself is not that important. So it's very confusing at, from some respect, but then uh, when we're talking about social economy organizations, we have cooperatives, uh, consumer cooperatives, and community uh, groups and as well. So I think if we put them all together, then I think the, uh, the impact would be very large, and that can be measured. We have to prove the impact, and uh, maybe that can be helped by uh, some measures provided by the uh, public organizations or the government. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Director Oh, 
Uh, I hope that uh, many attempts made by ICOOP could make a big success. Well, then we'll, we'll move on to Director Tong. So the social economy is facing a lot of challenges. There was pandemic and the pandemic has brought about big transformation in the society and the economy as well. So uh, we have to think about what kind of role social economy should play. There are people who are thinking about this and worried about this, but then there are people on the field as well. And statistically speaking, the social economy can be measured by sales and employment. But then if we look at the numbers itself, we see a large gap with the traditional sector. Well, we see well, we see maybe the average itself is not that low and it's high, but then we see very much uh, diversification uh, within the social economy sector too. So we talk about uh, these uh, concepts, but on the field, Surviving itself is a big challenge for many of the social economy organizations. As mentioned by the keynote speakers, as we are facing the socioeconomic change, we as the social economy organizations should adapt to the changes and find new directions. Then we have to think about how we can overcome these challenges and achieve these uh, tasks. Otherwise, we will see more uh, variations even within our social economy sector. So uh, we do have large uh, leading social enterprises. So maybe we can build, they can build network and uh, scale out and build larger scopes and then they can provide us with an umbrella so for the smaller ones to grow and survive and as director Andrew O'Brien has mentioned we have to focus on the social uh, outcomes and we also have to measure and aggregate data and market ourselves so that uh, loyalty from the consumers can build up. So I think these are very important points. So uh, these kind of large framework and uh, big context has to be uh, recognized by all of us. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Director Chong has been in this field for more than 20 years. And so she shared with us uh, the insights she have learned from the field. Especially, we have been going through digital transformation, COVID, uh, and also we're going through big transformation, including ESG movement. The large enterprises are actually responding very nimbly and rapidly, but social enterprises are seeing huge gaps uh, widening between them and the large enterprises. So uh, that's why we have to discuss further on how to overcome. Uh, so I think the most important keyword for today is shared value creation. We have to create value, but we have to do it together. The process is important and also we have to share uh, what the outcome was and also the economy of scale and scope are also important for us to build and as we build more sales channel we can create more networks and relationships so b2c b2g uh, examples uh, were uh, proposed to us as well and the cases of uk and the cases of france was also very um, useful and uh, very good for us 
and also the SPC's experiments are ongoing. So I think that could be a good starting point for our future direction. So if we can build our systems together, we can uh, keep in mind uh, the mentions from John Stuart, Mill, uh, John Stuart Mill. We have to have people to participate. Well, with that, I would like. I think that uh, everyone would be playing their role, such as the participants, speakers, and everyone watching online as well. We have a long way to go, but I think we could encourage each other and move on towards the uh, direction for the future. Well, with that, I would like to conclude our panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we talked about uh, ways to enhance the uh, d contribution of uh, social economy in this era of transition. I'd like to thank Professor Shin Hyun Sang for uh, moderating uh, and uh, speakers and panelists uh, for their uh, insights. So we have spent uh, all 95 minutes uh, for the uh, panel discussion, and I believe uh, the forum uh, is more successful this year because we have so many uh, viewers online. So, uh, so there were some comments uh, online, uh, like uh, it was a great chance to uh, uh, think about uh, social value once again uh, in solidarity, uh, cooperation, in uh, shared prosperity. Uh, are the keywords are I take away? Uh, from the uh, forum. Uh, so uh, there were many uh, other comments uh, who were uh, celebrating the success uh, of the forum and uh, expressing gratitude for the uh, speakers. So I hope uh, this uh, energy uh, and passion in our discussion uh, can continue into tomorrow's uh, program. So for uh, the uh, online uh, viewers, uh, we have prepared uh, some uh, rewards uh, for your uh, uh, for your uh, participation. So please check the announcement uh, on our uh, YouTube uh, chat box, and I'd like to thank you very much uh, for staying with us till the end of today's program. Once again, I thank all the speakers and panelists. Tomorrow, we have day two of the Shirts Forum, uh, starting from 2 p.m. Uh, with the uh, uh, title uh, of the stories of social enterprises overcoming challenges with uh, cooperation and solidarity. Uh, in today's program uh, is a talk uh, concert uh, with uh, great panelists. Thank you very much. I wrap up today's forum.